Hello everyone, welcome to the OTD D-Day live stream. So today I've got uh, a bit of a, a, a different plan on how I want to go about doing this. So I've got a, a few things I want to share, um, particularly about a big project I've decided to now launch. Uh, I'm going to do my best to get this project off the ground. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just going to give a rundown for today. Uh, there's two major stories I want to share uh, about D-Day. One's a Canadian story and a unit I'm sure many of you know that I've uh, covered in the past and, and have a connection to, a hometown connection to this particular unit and a little bit of show and tell of something I have uh, from them and it'll be cool. Uh, and then there's a few things other people have, oh, sorry, and another American story actually that I've been waiting to do something with for quite some time. Uh, and it's a really, really interesting one I found quite a while ago and haven't done anything with. Um, However, so uh, we'll get to that. And then, of course, uh, some people have asked me to talk about some other topics. So I've prepared some stuff on those. They're not necessarily D-Day topics, but they are Normandy topics. So I will cover those uh, with some insights I've had and made in the last little bit. And uh, then we can do q and I guess. Uh, we can do an AMA on this stuff if you like. Um, and I plan on going all afternoon um, if you like. So um, if, anyone, if people are still willing to watch and there are still good numbers, I'll keep going. But uh, other than that, I got a little something a little different to start off with today. So just bear with me for a moment and I want to get something running here. But I hope everyone's having a good day. We got a bit of a hazy time here in Ottawa now uh, due to the fires in Quebec. But I'm okay, not in danger. It's just I was extremely hazy. So we're going to start off today's live stream with a little uh, a little video that I've made. So that's a little clip I put together for the project I've been talking about on social media and with some people in person, um, just coming back from the conference in Laurier, all that good stuff. So the idea for this, and I know that's not uh, very heavy on the details in that one, but uh, it's kind of a hype video, as they like to say. So the idea is I'm going to make a project of videos, uh, other stuff, um, all kind of connected to Canada's campaign in Normandy. As we know, next year is the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy. Um, I'm hoping to be able to put together a series of videos, and you saw some of them mentioned there, uh, the titles of the uh, uh, the battles that had took place. That's just a handful. I only put in a few because I wanted to keep it nice and short. Um, but that's the plan, is I want to cover as many major Canadian engagements in Normandy from June 6th, right up to the closing of the Falaise Gap and the, and the push to the Seine as possible. So what I want to do is go to Normandy. I haven't been in quite a long time. Um, it, it's been since 2016 I've been there, so it's been quite some time. So what I want to do is get to these places. that The fighting took place. I've been to the mall, but I want to get back and, and be able to get footage and see the ground and do some filming while there. That's the idea. So that's what I want to do. Um, is do all of that and get those in there, get them mixed with archival footage, which you just saw a small portion of. Um, there's lots of it, lots of Canadian stuff, lots of other stuff as well. If I have time, I will go to the other beaches, um, tons of that stuff. So this is going to be a big, big project. Um, so what I need is some help. I'm just going to be outright honest with everyone of what I'm trying to do with this. I need some help with that. So there's many ways you can do that. Um, the best and easiest and cheapest way to help is to watch the videos on the channel. If you're new here, please subscribe. That is very, very helpful to me. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, uh, please do. Um, I, that really, really helps. Um, 
it, it helps get the numbers up. The bigger the numbers, the more people seem to respect channels. It's not even that's not even a reflection of quality. It's just this be how that goes with YouTube. The YouTube game is all about numbers. So getting the the viewer numbers up, the subscriber numbers up, the video, all that stuff. There's lots going on there. Um, there's tons of stuff connected to D-Day, Normandy. It's not all Canadian. For those of you who are interested in more just the Canadian, I try to cover different things. So that's the idea. Watching those and helping with the channel is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, sharing the stuff I've made is very, very helpful. Um, that helps a lot, um, especially people who may have not have heard my work or who I am or what I'm doing. Um, if you know someone who's never really heard of this stuff that I've done and might be interested in it, sharing with them is gratefully helpful. Uh, another thing is getting to... Um, Normandy is not going to be cheap, right? Air travel is getting more and more expensive. Um, it's, it's, it's more and more difficult to get there because of rising costs and things like that. So I, so I need some help with uh, fundraising. So anything you can give, there's descriptions down below for those of you watching later. Um, super chats are super helpful. Uh, becoming a patron or a YouTube channel member makes a huge difference. Just a few dollars a month. Um, it's based in Canadian for Patreon, and, and so it's pretty cheap for non-Canadians. You can just do a couple bucks or a couple euros, a couple pounds, what have you, whatever. Anyone who's watching for anywhere, anything is really, literally anything is helpful. Um, that makes a big difference because that way I can put all that money back into the project. And, and uh, Andreas is right. Um, hotels and the rental cars are so much more expensive and so much more difficult to do, but that'll be something I have to do because I'll have to be moving around in the public transit in Normandy. Um, um, is is It's not easy <laughs> if you've been there. Um, there is no public transit, really. Um, so you have to get a car to get into these particularly uh, unknown places that not a lot of people go to. Getting to the beaches isn't that, that bad. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's expensive. And just real quick here, Pat, yes, I am monetized. Um, so, you know, the ads that run, I, I do get a portion. Um, you can take, uh, uh, all, you know, you can give through uh, Super Chat right now, um, stickers, all that kind of stuff. You can do that, become a member. All of that is very helpful. That will make this project rea a reality because without that, I can't do it because um, it's just it's just too much. So if you are interested in wanting to see you know, Canada's battle in Normandy, the entirety, not just covering the beaches or one day for closing the Flays Gap. I'm trying to cover all of this as much as possible and in as depth as possible. It's going to be a year long project, probably more. Um, I'm hoping to have the first bits out on in a year from now. That's the idea it, it is get some landing, you know, the V-Day landing content out for the sixth and then, you know, progress through that and, and get it all out there. So, it's really, really helpful um, if you can give. And yeah, and and Pat makes another excellent point: is if you have eye blockers off, I don't, I don't get anything that if you watch the videos, right? Um, you don't. I'm not saying you have to all the time, but it would be helpful for my channel if you're watching my videos or some of the new ones. I put one out today. Um, just you know, this video I had it was an older one. I redid it, um, but you know, kind of the sounds from that famous North Shore footage. Um, so I, 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 there's the stories explained in the video. So please go watch that afterwards and keep uh, keep ads on and please watch them fully and watching videos fully is extremely helpful um, that helps uh and bur buying merchandise um oh sorry uh, sorry uh susan said something and i just missed it yes buying a t-shirt so there's a link down below for that as well uh, and it comes up on videos and things like that of buying some merchandise that helps um so it, it really helps um anything because I, I get a cut of those uh uh, proceeds. Um, and, and I'm putting all that back into this project. Um, so all of that is very, very helpful to get that stuff and get this project on the move because it's going to take some time over there to get all this together. And in uh, exactly as Susan says here, it, it will be in order. So I want to cover real quick. I want to cover uh, the landings, um, you know, that fight to that, you know, to that halt order that goes out uh, on the 6th the stuff into the seventh, the things that happen at the AR Den, uh, the brigade fortress fighting at Puteaux and Brettville and what goes on at Cardinville Farm, which I'll go and talk about later. Um, and then just moving forward after that, right? You know, the kind of the battles and things like Operation Windsor and the taking of Khan and the push south of Khan, totalized tractable, closing the gap all the way through. So they'll be done in order. So um, that's the idea. Uh, with that. Um, so that's the big project. That's going to be a year long plus project. I'm starting it as soon as I can after this. Um, 
So again, any support I can get with super chats like this, thank you so much. Um, it's very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, it makes a big difference. Um, so it's very, 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 very appreciated and very, very helpful to get these kinds of things that I can plug into, you know, getting over there and getting that rental car and, and getting everything. I have all the kit I need. Um, I have all the filming and I have all the cameras and everything, and it'll just require time in the archives to really get these stories done well. Um, but yeah, it'll be done in an archive. Uh, sorry, in a, in a timeline. That's the idea is get as much as I can. But uh, any bit you can help. And then thank you again. Um, any bit is, is extremely helpful. Uh, any bit you are able to give up uh, or to give to support me is, is, is gratefully, gratefully appreciated. Um, and again, everything's linked down below. You can get merchandise. You can help through Patreon. Uh, you can help through YouTube, uh, watch the videos, share the videos. All of that helps with this project. Any other video that's already out there, uh, watching the ads is very, very helpful. So anyway, um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for all of the help. I know some of you are patrons and YouTube channel members already. You can see that in the comments with the little symbol next to the name. That means they're a YouTube channel member. So thank you. So today, obviously, is the 79th anniversary of, of D-Day, right? That is, it's a big number. It's been a long time ago. This is an important date for so many. Um, obviously, for all kinds of reasons, it's a day of sorrow for some. My family lost a family member. Uh, Juno Beach um, from uh, the Regiment de la Chaudière. He, as far as I can tell, based on my research, never touched the sand alive. He, he didn't get in. So it's a day of sorrow for a lot, but a day of liberation as well, starting in Western Europe and France particularly, right? This is the first time the Normans um, had been um, uh, liberated since the fall of France. So it's, it's, it's a huge deal for kinds of people. And I mean, Normans were killed, you know, people, the French people were killed in the fighting and the bombing of hand and then all of that stuff. But I've read accounts of the troops coming ashore and working their way on Juno Beach through Bernays, uh, Bernays or Mare, and in behind, you know, where the famous Canada House is and which used to be the Queen's Own Rifles House, all of that. Um, cheering as the people, as the troops are coming up and the tanks are moving forward. Um, even though their houses were destroyed uh, because they knew the Nazis were gone. So it's, it, it's, it, it's amazing that they are so appreciative of still to this day, their ceremonies, there was a ton. I saw them a bunch of them before I went to bed last night, just because of the time difference. Um, I've been to a bunch when I was over there, there's a ton of them, um, all kinds of stuff going on, um, at the Juno beach center on the beaches themselves, um, all that stuff. And yeah, this is, uh, Oh, I thank you, Andreas. I really appreciate it getting uh, German support. It means a lot. Uh, and thank you again. And I'm sorry people give you such trouble for being so interested in this stuff. It's it's a great thing that you're interested in this stuff and that we're able to get a different perspective from, from you and learn from you. And we can all learn from each other and, and our interest and our mutual interest in this stuff. So it's great. So thank you again. It is much appreciated. Um, sorry, one second. Yes. So, so Alex here, just real quick, makes up a really interesting point and a really cool story I do like to tell is the, the Regiment de la Chaudière is primarily from Quebec, um, from kind of the St. Lawrence, uh, where it starts to widen after Quebec City and all of those things. Um, it's, it's all of that area kind of moving up. It's very small, the Gaspé Peninsula. That's where my relative was from. Um, so they had... Quebec accent that is kind of developed since then a little bit, uh, but it was kind of like an old Norman accent. So once these troops come in and who they thought were Brits, because they're in British uniforms, or what is they think are British uniforms, they hear them speaking French and they get very confused because they're speaking with this accent they sort of recognize. Be like, you know, um, you know, hopefully never, but if Americans get, say, whatever, get, say Boston gets occupied and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Shakespearean speaking Englishmen are coming on shore, it would be like that. It would be so confusing and you'd be like, why are you talking like that? And where are you from? And um, all that stuff. So it's a great story and they were so appreciative and they got really along very well with them um, afterwards, obviously, because they could communicate and they had a way to talk to everybody and what was going on, because it was not just over at that point, right? This is a battle that goes on for a long time. The lines stay forever again. That's something I'm hoping to cover in the series is how long that actually is. It's quite a long time is to how they try to push forward 
They take their initial objectives the next day, things like Brettville and Puto and all of that, and hold, right? They're trying to hold, particularly uh, for third division on Juno Beach. Uh, if you haven't read, and I'll link this stuff later, um, I don't lost the dust jacket at some point, but uh, if you haven't read Stopping the Panzers, um, you should. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, Mark Milner is a fantastic historian, fantastic person. Had him on the channel uh, last year. It looks like I'm wearing something over my eyes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a great book, but it's kind of groundbreaking in the sense of he digs into really what's going on of what the third division's actual role is. It's to push forward and then hold. So that's amazing. That, that That's what that role is. It's not just about filling in um, you know, the gap in between the two British beaches. They're here to stop the German armor. That's the point. They're there to stop it. That's why they're, and Mark does an excellent job of covering all this. Um, they're, you know, added artillery and things like that. And it, it's it's a fantastic story and how the Canadians are playing such crucial role to stop that first counterattack by the SS uh, uh, armored divisions. Um yeah, it's it's a great story. It's a great book. Um, it only goes up until it goes from the landings. Um, talk about the North Shore, that famous footage, um, up until the eleventh or something like that. So it's um, it's great. So it's uh, it, it's fantastic. And it covers that, and it's a fantastic book. And if you want an eye opening experience, and I suggest this for anyone, it's not just those who are interested in Canada and D Day. If you're interested in D Day General, I mean, this is one of the assault divisions, uh, and they play a crucial role in stopping the German counterattacks, right? Because the armor is not hitting the American sectors. It's not really hitting other parts of the beaches. It's, it's hitting right where the Canadians are because it's tank country. Uh, and that's something why I need to get there. And this for, that would be a particular episode, right? Is um, you have to show this because if you've never been there and you don't see it, it it's hard to, to describe what this area looks like. And, and it's wide open where some parts obviously famously or infamously in the American sectors um, it's all that bocage, right? And some parts, some of the British ones as well. So it's hard to advance th forward with, you know, armor to counter an attack or to bring up your armors like the Allies are to push forward. It, it's not easy to do. It's better to do um, this area. And this is where it comes to a head. Um, anyway, so yeah, so it's a really interesting book. Mark does an excellent job. He researched this one for a long time. His father landed on D-Day. Um, it, it, it's all that stuff. So it's, he's got his father's recollections in there. It's, it's crazy. Um, and it's such a good story. So sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm having trouble keeping up with the comments because you guys are, are firing fast. So sorry. I'm just going to go through stuff quick. So yeah, that's what we'll do, I guess. So kind of go through and then move to my next stuff. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. Um, the super chat. Thank you so much. Um, already helping so much with this. It, it's fantastic. And, and thank you, Pete. I know you're watching. I, I saw you made a comment here earlier. Um, thank you for your contribution when we were at the conference. That was that was great. It, very much helpful. It's my first uh, addition to the you know the the pot for for this trip and this project. Yeah, I mean it's different French. It's still different French today um, between France and. Uh, um Quebec it's very different uh a recording of them speaking with the French accent not that I've been able to find just because unfortunately a lot of the audiovisual from the Canadian perspective is not digitized not like the United States or Britain we just don't have all that much unfortunately um it's in the archive but even then they have such strict copyrights they don't let you record anything it's it's quite unfortunate Oh, hey, Chris, thanks for coming out. I was surprised when people in Montreal refuse to speak English. Oh, that's really interesting. It's usually the opposite. If you try to speak French and then it's not to their liking, they'll just speak English at you. I guess it depends on who the individual is, but I was just in Montreal and that happened a lot. Uh, so quickly, no, uh, not the Canadian units. They're all Shermans at this point. Um, but they are supported by Churchill's um, in the engineers, you know, the uh, assault vehicle, Royal Engineers, AVREs. Uh, there's one that was just redone. I don't know how long ago it is. I don't remember off the top of my head. I had a picture of it before. 
um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's a Sherman, or sorry, it's a Churchill that was in the road, uh, that they dug out. It was in the eighties, maybe I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so yeah, so it, it was uh, dug out and it's now a monument to the engineers. Uh, so that's where those come in. Some of the funnies, right? Like the, the crocodiles with the flamethrowers and all that stuff. Those were Churchill's, but the Canadian armored units, which we'll get to, uh, once I get through this last batch here of questions and comments and stuff, uh, was Sherman's on the day and duplex drive Sherman's as well. Uh, okay, so yes, I mean, this is one of the, this is just generally speaking for Canada in the Second World War, World War II. Uh, at the beginning they were, because uh, that's how the, the, the mobilization was organized was on a regional basis. It, it just... It didn't always stay that way. Reinforcements kind of got spread around. People moved around with promotions and, and people getting shifted. So, yes, they are technically regional in that sense, right? Like, uh, one I know the best of the best is the Hong Kong units, right? Like, the Royal Rifles of Canada is technically based out of, or was based out of Quebec City. So people always would say, the Royal Rifles of Quebec City, which wasn't true because you had people from eastern Quebec and the eastern townships that are very well known, and even in New Brunswick and, and all of that area with, you know, um, with all the Acadians that spoke French. Some of them were part of that unit. So it, it, it's roughly yes, because that's where regiments are based. But these battalions that, that they organize, and maybe one day I can do a show on how the Canadian Army is actually organized in the Second World War, because it's a little clearer than the First World War. Um, but uh, it's it, it's it changes over time. So yes, they have sort of a regional feel, but by the end of the war, that's kind of gone. Um, they don't really really uh, do that anymore. Yes, and thank you for everyone for helping with the channel growing. Um, I have a big overall goal of trying to hit ten thousand by the end of twenty twenty three for subscribers. We'll see if that happens. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would be awesome. Just cause again, like I said, the meaning numbers do kind of make a difference. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. Um, Chris is that photos are a copyright. So is the films. It's no different. It's the same. They just, they won't digitize it. And then when you try to do this yourself, um, it's, it's, it's not, easy because I first trying to do this for a project um, that I was doing on a side, just a quick aside, but the difficulties we face here in Canada is I was trying to do that. I was trying to take just a quick clip just for a film that the muse war museum wanted to use potentially for an exhibit that's coming up. And I asked the archivist, can I just use my phone? I mean, it's not going to be great, but at least they'll get an idea of what they can see because it's not digitized. They said no. So I don't know what's going on there, but it's all a copyright because it was made by government officials. So it's it's it, it expired after 50 years, and that was a long time ago for some of this stuff. So it's just it doesn't it shouldn't be uh, held off like that. Uh, hey, Laura, um No, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I, I last major estimate I heard was around 10,000, but I, that was maybe years ago, prior to COVID. Um, so I'm sure it's it's. Uh, gone down since then but i don't know if anyone's done it overall in a while just because like we said like i said with covid and everything changing um, it's unfortunate but uh, uh, uh and, and every day it goes down right so it's it's not uh, it's quite sad yeah there are ones posted i know that's ones i use mostly um yeah, there's actually some there's more canadian stuff in the american national archive which is sad but um Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I mean, Alex, this is a good question. Uh, I mean, it's been covered. David O'Keefe knows this stuff through and through. Um, it has no connections to D-Day. It wasn't done for D-Day. The connections come afterwards. Like, like I already mentioned, like the tanks that the engineers used, that was uh, because of Dieppe. I mean, not every engineer went on to the shores of Normandy in a tank. I've seen the footage of them literally trying to run up to keep up with the AVRE, which is really interesting and kind of funny to watch. The tank comes crashing down onto the landing craft, and there's these guys just running after it, trying to keep up with it. Um, anyway, so yeah, there is uh, 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 lessons taken from it, but it's not something that was done on purpose. And, and, and David O'Keefe has covered this to a T and seen all the documentation. There's no mention of the eventual return to Normandy or eventual return to France in connection to Dieppe. It just doesn't happen. Um, it comes later, and it's used as a post facto justification for Dieppe, particularly by Mountbatten, 
um, for his own PR ends. And he was another one of those allied masters of PR that we now see through since we've got all the documentation now. And he's, of course, he was exe executed. He was murdered. So all his stuff came to light. And there's still some stuff that's being censored, which is really interesting. And they're not really sure why, but people have their guesses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And today, back then, yes. Um, yes, they are connected enough to uh, to speak. Uh, it's just, it's, how do I say this? Um, not an insulting either, because I have French Canadian background myself. Um, it's seen as the French Canadians are viewed by the French as like the backwoods cousins, like that were not as class, you know, classy. And we speak this rougher version of, of French and it's all not the same. And I've seen conversations, they can understand each other perfectly fine. Um, most of the accents out of Quebec anyway, or, or French Canada, uh, it, it's completely fine. Um, they just, it's, it, it's kind of like comparing a New York accent to an Alabama accent in a way, or, you know, the posh English accent, to, I don't know, poor neighborhood accent or something like that. It's, it's seen as lesser, which is not fair, but it is what it is. And thank you, Phil. Yes, the Rams were not used, is that you guys are talking about the Ram? Not using combat as a tank. They were used later on uh, as other things. Yeah, and the kangaroo, which I have a video of on the channel. Uh, sorry, you guys have so many questions, right? Oh, thank you, uh, Nicholas. I appreciate that. Sorry if I missed anything. Um, I'm just trying to catch up here. I guess this has turned into an AMA. <laughs> um, uh, so no, Acadians are uh, not all went to Louisiana. Some were shipped to France, actually. Um, a good number came back. Uh, and it's actually mostly New Brunswick now. Um, mostly New Brunswick, um, kind of all over that. Maritimes in a way in that time, but uh, mostly been now concentrated in New Brunswick. Um, and then it's a separate identity than Quebec. And separate again from other portions of French Canadians, right? Like my family is Franco Ontarian, and they've been in Ontario. Uh, my great grandmother was from Gaspé, just like the relative who was killed at Dia, or sorry, Juno, at Juno Beach. Um, but then after that, they've been Franco Ontarian, and my other side is Franco Ontarian, and have been for generations and generations. So it's it's a little different. But uh, yeah, some of them, a good chunk of them, are what become the Cajuns of Louisiana. That's where it starts. Uh, yes, nothing planned as of yet about World War One TV. I've been trying to help, you know, Woody and, and Lucy get that promoted and get their numbers up because they need help getting that monetization. So if you have an interest in World War One, um, it's easy to find World War One TV. Just after this, you can uh, search it because um, I know some people are interested in World War One who watch my stuff because I cover as much as I can. Right. So if you haven't uh, checked them out, please do. They did an AMA and they did some other stuff and they're planning on doing a bunch of content related to the Eve salience. I'm not sure when that's coming towards the end of the month, maybe into July. I can't speak for certain, um, but they need help getting up to that monetization level. So I do watch their stuff. Um, but there's talk of me going on about what, I don't know yet. They're still trying to figure out their early stuff. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be good stuff because they're going to do what Woody does on World War II TV, uh, but for World War One and trying to connect them together and have theme weeks that go together and, try to get the inner war stuff for both of them and mix it all together. I think it's going to be great. It's a great idea. I was going to start to suggest to Woody to do World War One TV anyway. <laughs> and he just came to me one day and said, I'm doing it. Or he's asking my thoughts. And I said, I'm, I'm going for it. So I said, you should. Uh, anyway, so yes, there's talk to me going on. I don't know when or on what topic, but I'm sure there's quite a few things I can cover for them. Yeah, I don't feel sorry for Man Ban at all. Um, he dug his own proverbial problems or grave, if you will, for that. Um, it's it's he didn't do himself any good um, with that. He could have explained it differently. Like there's top secret things that we needed to do, and that was it. Instead, he just kept doubling down on the things that were not true. I know, so many questions. You guys are fast. <laughs> I think I may have caught up. 
Yes, George, you are correct. Um, World War One TV has hit a thousand subscribers, but to re- achieve monetization, it's not just a thousand subscribers. You have to um, um, get four thousand watch hours. So, like things like live streams, that's why it's good to watch them because it's, if you know a thousand people were to watch them for an hour, that's a thousand hours. So they got to hit that. So if you haven't seen their stuff, please go back and check it out and spread it to new people as well. That's where those numbers really start to go up is when new people see it. So yes, they're at the thousand subscribers, but it's only half of the, you know, what you got to do. Yes, I very I very much am looking forward to it. I'm just, they're still working on their, their kind of next to launch into things, right? So we'll see after that, how they uh, kind of get into the rhythm and then uh, hopefully I can jump on. Yeah, it is all connected, Andreas. I I, I agree. Um, it's it's really interesting. Oh, and uh, hey, Sean, thanks for <clears throat> excuse me for coming on board and being YouTube channel member. Very much appreciated. Um, along with the rest of you, Susan, everybody else, and Susan's a great supporter of people doing history and, and science as well. She's a great supporter. Um, she's a great person. So, way to go, Susan <laughs> and Sean. Woo, and Andreas as well. Great supporter, and thank you for the super chat yet again. Uh, but yes, it, I I I'm, I used to not be so interested in the interwar period and then i got my interest in world war one more academically and then connecting it to world war ii and now it's just it's such a fascinating time period of how these things all connect together and it's it, it's amazing um, that people are able to do this um yeah yeah i'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about vimy rage more than once um um yeah it's uh it was, you know, if you've never seen my shows on this stuff, I don't think it's it's so easy as that. Um, um, just to talk about Vimy Ridge as it is, because I think it's overdone and, and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, sometimes this doesn't work, though. If you just let it run, it has to be new videos. If you just keep watching the same video over and over again, it won't count, uh, unfortunately, for them. So um, that's why you got to spread it around. Uh, or if you find something really interesting, tell them, people about it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so okay, so now that we've kind of got that <clears throat> initial half an hour rush over, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, 1923 in Germany. Sorry, yeah, as you guys know, sometimes I get uh, distracted. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, tons going on in 1920, well, 1919 all the way through, uh, particularly into the mid 20s. It's, it's a crazy time period in Germany and so much change and counter change and anyway you're the expert on that uh, yeah um, but yeah yeah well very rigid would be very much part of the the the, the program um, that i'm trying to run the project but very rigid would be its own uh, episode probably one for the black watch because the you know kind of the lower myth that's gone into that and then looking at um um the other units sorry um that fought it the same as part of Operation Spring as well, right? The Black Watch tends to get a lot of the attention. Um, so I would love to cover the other units that also fly on the bridge that day. Okay, so if you don't mind, um, we can uh, keep your questions coming in or if you think of something, but I want to just do a uh, talk about the first Azars, uh, if that's okay with everyone. So this is one of the stories I wanted to share. So so this is Lieutenant, uh, I forget his name, Christopher uh, McLeod. Oh, Charles, sorry. I apologize, Charles. Uh, McLeod. So he is part of the first Azars. Um, he is one of the commanders of one of the ta- DD tanks, which are known as duplex drive tanks. Um, that launches from a landing ship tank and then goes to the shore. So the idea is these would launch first, sit in the water and try to you know suppress or pick off German strong points, bunkers, uh, machine gun nests, all that stuff so that the infantry could come in and then they would push ashore and then, sorry, I can't see myself. Hopefully this is making sense with my hand. They push ashore and then the infantry comes in behind. They had some technical problems uh, and we'll talk about it. As. So as we move along, and I've already done a video on the first Azars. Um, I'll link it afterwards. You can check it out afterwards. It's about them landing on Juno Beach on D-Day. Uh, and it's a little more in depth than this will be, but this is just a cool story I wanted to try and make a video with. And I might, if, I don't ramble too much and I can kind of edit this better. I'll pick this part out of the live stream and then put it up as a video talking about McLeod's experiences um, landing on Juno Beach. So in the war diary for the first Azars, 
there is um, reports. So you have uh, McLeod's report. Um, you have one from Leo Garapé. I'm sure many of you have heard of him and we'll come back uh, to him in a minute. Um, he is the one, the individual who's responsible for those of you who have been to uh, Corso sur Mer for having that tank, the DD tank in the center there, um, you know, and by the main town part there, by the harbor, um, by the waterway, just on the other side of um, the Juno Beach Center. So it's called, the tank was called Bold. It had sunk. It was the um, squadron commander um, of the first Azar's tank went in and and, and uh, submerged um, and it was swamped and went under. Um, but that they picked it out in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and it's now been sitting there and Garapé was the reason for that. And he moved to Corsoles and it's a great story and I hope to do more with him in the future. However, um, so, so why McLeod's is really interesting is we'll get to that why. So he talks about how he has to prep um, um, this tank. You have to get it ready, right? Because I did another video um, where they're designing and, and showing how a DD tank works. You can again check that out after as well. Um, you have to get a screen up that inflates and then is held in by place by steel struts that keep it up, keep the structure up. And that way it can float into land and there's propellers on the back and you can steer your way in and go in. So that's what they have to prep, make sure that's all good to go. Everything is the way it should be. So they're doing that at about, <clears throat> excuse me, 0, 5, 30 hours on the 6th. Uh, and of course, uh, rough conditions. We know um, the conditions prior to D-Day were difficult, right? The, plant, the entire invasion is postponed a day, um, famously, and discussion of the weather. Um, the... Uh, the uh, Mulberry Harbor, made of those steel casings, or sorry, concrete casings, is destroyed in a later storm. That's why there's only the one at Aramange in the British section is the only one left. Um, so we know that these conditions are extremely difficult. So this comes up. Um, so um, so we have to get that ready. So, <clears throat> and this is quoting directly from, um, from McLeod's report here. So he noted that the water was quite rough at the time. And when we were 7,000 yards out, the Navy commander asked Major Duncan, uh, the commander, uh, commander of B Squadron, which is what uh, McLeod and Garapay were part of, uh, what they should do. Sorry, one second here. Um, oh, sorry, he said if it, he thought it was too rough to, too rough to launch, so they went in closer, um, closer into the shore to about 4,000 yards, which was inside the a subscribed launching distance for a DD tank. It wasn't supposed to be more than 5,000 yards uh, due to being swamped and all that stuff. Um, so yes, so that's part of it. Uh, and yes, I see a question about um, um, a DD could fire in the water. Yes, they could. So the idea is you could control the sides of the screen independently. Um, it could drop it. You can drop the front. Uh, more because it was independent with the air canisters. It wasn't just a big one that was doing all of them. You could say deflate this part of the thing underneath. I mean, very difficult to see. Like there's store, you can see in the videos I've done on this and uh, the video I did on this a while back. Um, you could the commander or whoever was driving it was above their head was above the screen, so they could see. So if they ordered them to drop it a little bit, and that's done from inside the driver position. Um, it, you can tell them what to do and they can drop the screen and then they can direct the fire. Um, and that was the plan and they could do so. And some did. Um, and not, um, not McLeod's tank, but uh, some did at Juno beach fire from the water, uh, particularly from the first desires, but that was on a different sector of the beach. Um, not this one in and of itself. So at about 4,000 yards, they launch um, the first and second goes McLeod is in behind that. Uh, so, and then uh, McLeod talks about, and this is again a quote, I steered my tank all the way to the shore because it was too rough, rough for the driver to steer down under the water, down below in the tank position, and there was too much going on because they couldn't see, so they would have relied on um, uh, the, those up top telling them where to go, <laughs> commander up top. So the commander, McLeod, just did it himself. So he just drove straight in because it was so difficult. He didn't wait to, uh, to fire or try to support the infantry that way. Uh, so remac remac uh, miraculously, sorry about that, everyone, his tank lands in the right spot. <laughs> that is very uncommon for the DDs across Normandy that land on D-Day. He was in the right position along with those other two that were with him. Um, and then a few infantry landed almost behind them. So this is how it was supposed to go, um, but it didn't quite work out. 
as they wanted with the timing. So they were right behind them. And he talks about deflating a screen and immediately engaging German pillboxes uh, right to their immediate front. Um, so they're having to engage those, suppress them, and destroy them with their machine guns and uh, the main, uh, main gun of the tank. Uh, so he talks about after after 15 minutes, the uh, engineers show up with their uh, AVREs to clear the beach and make beach exits. Uh, and they do it fairly quickly, especially being for under fire uh, in about half an hour. So so McLeod leads his troops, so three tanks, uh, through the gap uh, to find the infantry company that has now gone ahead of them. Uh, so they move through Corsol, meeting very little opposition uh, because the infantry had been clearing it, uh, but also catching up with the infantry and supporting the remainder of the attack. So uh, they came to the outskirt of the town. Again, at the time, it was very small. It's not a big place today. Um, still very, very small at the time. So they get outside the town, which wouldn't have taken very long in terms of driving distance. They see a mine sign saying there's mines over here. Um, so the infantry work their way ahead, and it turns out there is no mines. So the Germans just threw up a sign saying there's mines, uh, and that's it. <laughs> there isn't any, so they continue on. Uh, so they continue the advance. Um, uh, uh, oh, and I see, sorry, this question I can answer very quickly. At Omaha, the DDs are Shermans. They're all Shermans uh, all across. Uh, on the British beaches, Canadian and American, they are all Sherman DD tanks. Yes, the development started with the Valentine, and there was other work being going on, but the ones who land uh, Normandy are all Shermans. Uh, so they covered the uh, advance um, all the way to, uh, no, AVR, not flail tanks, the actual engineering tanks they use just to get closer. Um, with all the, you know, big heavy uh, spigot motor on the front there. Um, so they covered the infantry in, back to the first Cesars here, back to the uh, infantry advance to Riviere, where they take out, where they took two bridges in control because the Souls River winds its way through into this area. Uh, so uh, McLeod takes his tank to the center of town um, and then and they go to move through to secure it um, with the town covering a platoon of infantry when they're opened up on. So he opens up on them with six rounds of high explosives in the position. And then as he moves forward, he can see about five German dead in the road near where the position used to be. So the uh, commanding officer of the Regina Rifles, the infantry who they are supporting, uh, wanted them to move up to the right flank to cover the infantry who continue on forward. So uh, McLeod is leading the squadron now uh, because the squadron leader's tank had been swamped and sunk. Uh, so he's moving forward. So at this point, the squadron, B squadron, is two tanks from squadron HQ, another troop of three tanks, and his troop. So they moved to the right or the west of the town and swung through the fields to the south. Uh, at this point, he sees a haystack and just opens up <laughs> with two rounds of high explosive. At that point, he notes he feels a jolt in the tank, and then the turret moves on its own. Uh, the driver reports that his periscope is gone. He can't see anything. And the gunner reported that his traverse gears are broken. Uh, and he immediately gives the order to the driver to swing left and speed up to get out of there. A moment later, another shell hurts the, hurt, hits the top of the turret, hitting the copula lids on top. I can show you those in a second with my little show and tell. Um, so Garapay talks about this point in his report about seeing McLeod's tank burst into flames. Um, so that's quite interesting to see that these two things are being reported about three weeks after the landings themselves, um, but from two different uh, aspects and from two different individuals. So going back to McLeod, and again, this is quoting here, um, my face seemed cut and my earphones and tin hat, so the earphones used for the internal communications of the tank and his helmet are knocked off his head. Uh, and then he crouches down um, to the driver to give orders um, to give, uh, sorry, so that uh, to keep moving and have the co-driver um, who usually operates the frontal machine gun, uh, to tell him where to go because his periscope is still intact. Uh, at this point, the tank is on fire. So the driver, uh, sort of no, for the gunner operator, pulls out a fire extinguisher uh, and hits all the knobs to try with the fire suppression systems. Uh, but they don't really work. Uh, the motor stops working, so they all bail out. Gunner operator and uh, McLeod himself get out through the turret on top and onto the ground. Uh, but they unfortunately find that the turret was in such a position that it would not allow the driver or co-driver's hatch to be opened. The DD screen, the canvas screen that made it float, is on fire at this point. So they're trying to 
move all of this off. Um, so at some point, it doesn't say how he does it, uh, but McLeod is able to move the turret enough to let the driver and co-driver get out. Um, I don't know how he does it. I don't know if it's manually or he goes back inside. He doesn't say. Uh, so actually, unfortunately, the co-driver can't get out of the hatch after it's been cleared because of Bostic. It's a type of sealant that was used to waterproof the DD. So they would use the sealant on top of the, the on top of the uh, the door, uh, so they didn't get in. So the wire can't get in. But it worked so well, he couldn't get the door back open. So it goes out through the driver's uh, driver's hatch. Uh, at this point, because they're under fire, they go in front of the tank into the high wheat to hide. Uh, but at this point, he mentions how uh, McLeod mentions at this point, he can't see outside his right eye. He can't see out of his right eye, uh, but nobody else is injured uh, miraculously. Uh, he says that he thinks that around this time, it's around 1630. So around 430 in the afternoon. Uh, so at this point, the whole crew works their way back to Rivers, uh, where they go to a regimental aid post. Uh, a doctor checks him out, uh, tells him he can't get the shrapnel out of his eye in those conditions. So he sends him back to the beach, to a dressing station in a Jeep. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. And I didn't know they still did this in the 1940s. The doctor at the dressing station puts cocaine on his eye and tells him he's got to go back to England <laughs> to get it fixed because he can't do it in these conditions as well. So he's got cocaine applied directly to his eye. So at that point, he spends the night on the beach waiting to go back to England. Um, he gets permission the next day to go to a larger field dressing station with the chance that they could take care of his eye and he could go back to the unit. Um, at this point, he knows there's several pieces of shrapnel in his face and neck. He gets told at the field dressing that it would be necessary to see an eye specialist, surgeon, uh, and then have to go back to England for this because they don't have one. Um, so he gets loaded onto an LST landing ship tank at around 1400. Uh, when a naval surgeon puts more cocaine on his eye, <laughs> and then takes the shrapnel out while he's got the cocaine on his eye. Um, but he still says, you still got to go back to England. So he goes back to England to a casualty clearing station there, somewhere along the coast, he doesn't say, uh, and then taken to the, one of the Canadian hospitals in, in Britain. By the sounds of it, he has actually quite a speedy recovery uh, because he rejoins the unit um, in time for Operation Spring, which I was talking about earlier. Um he ends up getting wounded again on the 25th, the first day of the day of Operation Spring at Verrier Ridge. Uh, this is the second time he's wounded and it ends his war. His war service ends at this point. The wound is serious enough that he's sent home. So, yeah, that's just the one story that I've been sitting on for a while. It's been in the war diary. Um, other people have talked about it. Um, he, takes, he takes a blow, I guess, the shrapnel or, you know, the jagged edges from inside. Um the turret and uh, you know is able to keep going somehow and thinks he can keep fighting um seems the cocaine to the eye the official application of the cocaine um seems to have made the difference <laughs> making him feel like he could go back um all that stuff so um yeah it's 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 a crazy story and he comes back in time for operation spring especially for taking a chunk of metal to the multiple chunks of metal to the face and he's able to come back. So yeah, they just straight up apply um, cocaine to his face. Um, so yeah, I'll go through the questions, but did he regain his vision? As far as I know, yes. Um, I, I don't know otherwise. It doesn't say otherwise. I couldn't find his um, um, his record or anything like that, unfortunately. So um, yeah, as far as I know, yes, because someone within the first desires did some research on this. So, oh yeah, I forgot to do this one moving forward. But um, so this is the this is taken uh, just after the landings at uh, at Core Soul. So you can see the river and why it takes this weird, crazy course, and where the Juno Beach Center sits today, on you know what's called the island over here. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, this is why taking that those bridges into to Rivere were so important, and this is where McLeod is talking about fighting his way through, and Garapay does the same, talks about how they basically have to blast through these walls to advance um, through the town uh, and do it bit by bit. So yeah, it's a really cool photo. Uh, and here you can see the fires that are breaking out in the town and getting a better idea of where the Juno Beach Center uh, sits today. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool footage. Um, or sorry, photos from uh, from D-Day. And there's more taken over. So I'm just going to go back here because um, I know there was a bunch of questions. and I missed them. So just let me... Uh... Yeah, so... Um, oh, hey, Scott. Uh, hopefully you got, you got here in time for... Um, I'm not sure when this came in. So hopefully... Uh, you got in time to hear that story. Uh, if not, you can watch it later as well. And I might try to hopefully edit it or redo it again into a separate video when I get some time. But yes, sorry, going back to the questions. Yes, DD tanks, uh, some of them were. Uh, that was an idea. They hadn't worked it a little bit um, to do with the Churchills. Uh, but yes, it would have required them kind of be backwards and that would have gone counter to the reason why the DDs were going to be used in the first place because they were going to be floating gun platforms. Yes, and I'm sure you guys talked about this later, but yes, the Valentines were the first one uh, to talk about this. Again, I did a video on the DDs and showing them how they do it, and there's a book uh, about this by Steve. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced his name. Uh, uh, Zagola. Uh, it's a great book, and it really gives you good insights into the development of the DDs and how they're used in World War II. Yes, there was a lot of, um, I think proportionally, yes, there's the most are lost at Omaha, and that comes to basically define in people's minds the DDs, right, which is not a fair assessment, because at Juno, they're actually quite successful in doing what they're supposed to do. Like, Garapay's tank makes it through, and he's taking out positions right then and there. Um, there's a article, sorry, a, a letter, a note from, I think it's in July, mid-July, I can't remember off the top of my head, in the first Desar's War Diary from uh, the Royal Winnipeg Rifles uh, about how without the first Azars, the, the casualties in their sector would have been huge and much bigger than they were. So that is, uh, uh, it, it, I think that speaks volumes to the role that the DDs played and how quickly they were able to get them there. I mean, they may not have worked as initially envisioned, but they were able to get them on there and that made a huge difference. Enough for the CEO to write a letter to them saying, thank you. I mean, I don't see that very often of a unit CEO saying that to another one saying thank you. But I don't see that often at all, particularly that close to the action. Um, yeah, they did in some ways. Um, they didn't use the same idea like the AVRE. They didn't do that. Um, um, they just had their engineers come on um, that were part of the Navy Beach Battalions that came on and, and did that work. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that video. It's it's very powerful. Um, any of these guys talking about this stuff, it's uh, uh, it's intense. So at Omaha, I mean, uh, Steve Zagola, there we go. He came to me, comes to me. Was on World War II TV a while ago, talking about Omaha, the the, the DDs on Omaha. They were launched too far out uh, for the conditions, especially, but even for their you know perfect conditions where they tested them in like a calm lake and kind of things. They were too far out and they got swamped and came under. So they stopped doing that and just landed them on the beach, um, which ends up helping. Um, but yeah, it's it's intense um, what happens at Omaha because they're too far out and they're not meant to go that far and it just ends poorly. Yeah, and of course Rob covered this. Yeah, it's, it's I know I'm just obviously very interested in the first Cesars and I'm very interested in in the DDs because I think it's just it's a, such an interesting um, story. Yeah, I'll find it. Uh, <clears throat> I got a bunch of linking to do for this afterwards, so I'll, I'll link it down below as well, so people can check that out. Yeah, always a co-driver on board as long as there's uh, um, personnel to do it, because you need someone to work the machine gun, and as we saw, it offers another set of eyes. I know, Laura, it's insane, right? It just Straight up cocaine to the eye. I don't think it's like just pure coke. <laughs> I'm sure it's diluted, but still, that's just crazy to hear. It just puts it straight on the eye. I mean, we think morphine's insane, and then they're going with cocaine right to the face. I mean, Speedy, relatively speaking. I mean, he's back in time for Operation Spring after taking chunks of metal to the face. 
So that's uh, that's pretty it's pretty intense. <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, I have water here somewhere. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, so, yeah, yes, they tried. Um, it was a little damaged. Um, it's a little damaged a little bit. Oh, sorry, wrong answer. Anyway. Uh, um, uh, it was damaged a little bit. I mean, it's not a big one to begin with. Uh, it's not like it can take, you can see it. Oh, actually, I'll pull it back up. You can see it's still here, right? This is the entrance. I can't, can I zoom in on here? Nope. Well, oh, so there's Garapé. Sorry, that's Garapé. Uh, you can see it here. This is the entrance to the harbor. I know it's pretty small, and I can't do the zooming anymore um, without having to go back out and everything. Actually, I guess I could. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, one second. No, oh, no, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, bear with me, everyone. Uh, anyway, no. Oh, here we go. Let's do it down here. Here we go. So you can see here the harbor entrance isn't very big. Um, the harbor's still not very big today. It's just mostly for pleasure craft. <clears throat> so you can't get anything big in there to offload enough of supplies. That was part of the plan, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. I shared a map yesterday um, from the uh, overall. It was from the Western Task Force. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the Western Task Force that it was landing in the American side. Um, but showing the major ports like Osterheim and, and, and all those and the Seine and all those places. Of course, Souls is on there. So clearly it was part of the thinking that, that they could maybe potentially use it. It gets used a little bit, but as you can see, it's not big enough to do much. Still not very big. I mean, there's a bridge over there. It's pretty easy to get across. Same with the Nidner Canal that's there as well. It's not that difficult to get across anymore. I mean, it never was, even on the day. Um, yeah, the, it's not because it's clear. It's because it's that low. Um, you can see that some of them, and not one, I don't think one on here, um, they're just taking them for, like this one's obviously from much lower and this is right after, right? This is at the same time. They're running mosquitoes and I can't remember what the Americans are running um, for the aerial reconnaissance and the photo taking, um, but they're really low and really fast. So that's how they're able to get this. Um, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to, what's wrong answer? Um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay, that's good to hear, Scott. Um, um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, they they did. Yeah, the Bobby. I watched that one. The Tank Museum has a good video on it because they have an original, as far as they can tell. It's all original parts, except maybe the screen. I don't know. I think or no, it's an after. I can't remember. Uh, it's older. I don't know if it's exactly you know made at the time as these ones. Um, but it's got, uh, um, it's got the screen on the canvas screen and everything. And it's really cool. I hope that one day to be able to get there and go see it. Yes, we know a lot about cocaine. <laughs> uh, no, that's just the river, uh, Phil. They, they, there's not anything to, to inundate there. Uh, it's a little bit of a rise at certain points, but no, there's nothing to inundate. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, I just saw um, Ivan's answer, which makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, no, there's nothing to inundate. You can just see it. That's just the course of the Souls River because you can see it connects right through here and then widens out through here. So they even if they tried to inundate it, it wouldn't have stopped the landings because there's no plan really to come through here. Obviously, they're landing um, – um, here, but the exit is up here off the screen, and the other beach exit is further up here. Now it's still actually open. You can land a tank there now and get it out um, and up here as well. Um, but yeah, so you can see them landing, but the exit's actually on this side. Um, and after they've come across, because that's why they had to secure that bridge into uh, um, and we're there. Yes, Spitfires, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, because it's so fast. Um, yes, I saw they cut a hole in it. That's not cool. That is not cool. Uh, not on the beach. Not as far as I know. I don't think so. There's guns. Like, there's guns on the beach. There's a 75 and an 88. And, uh, I mean, it's still there uh, outside of uh, uh, Bernays Samir. Or actually, right on the beach. Or is it between Aubain and same? I don't know. They're also squished together. It's hard to remember where one stops and one begins. 
Um, it's still there. Oh, uh, taken French gun from earlier in the war. Uh, there's 88s in behind, so that's technically an anti-aircraft gun, but not like set up on the beach beach. They don't do that. Um, uh, they don't do that because they were just got blown to pieces. Um, everything's back in behind. Uh, but no, nothing um, on the beach itself. There's guns a little further back, and one's still there today. I, I'm not entirely sure, but I think Garapay is the one who puts the holes in it. Um, I did the live stream with, with Woody on World War II TV a long time ago now uh, on D-Day. I think it was D-Day 2021? 2020? I don't remember. Uh, anyway, may have been 2021. Uh, anyway, where uh, Mag goes and, and shows us the whole, pretty sure Garapay did those. Um, the gun got moved further up from where it actually was uh, on the day. Uh, no. Absolutely not. I mean, some had moved out as refugees and didn't want to stay there. Um, some people just moved around because they moved around. But Normandy was away from the fighting, right? In 1940, there was no fighting in Normandy. Uh, nothing major going on because they had already been cut off, right, at Dunkirk and, and at Calais and all that stuff. So, no, there's no evacuation. The Germans don't know that this is the main landing area. Some of them don't believe it's going to be the main land area and that's going to happen at Calais. Um, so, no, there's no... Um, um, there's no uh, evacuation coming. The Allies can't say that. I mean, they're saying uh, unknown, um, sorry, messages that the Germans don't know what they mean, uh, telling them that the invasion's coming the night before to the French resistance. Um, so yes, that's, uh, uh, so no. So a lot of people do get killed, unfortunately. Uh, and on later on as the fighting continues, I mean, infamously at Khan, large number of civilians are killed supporting uh, the operations and the taking of the city. Yes, it is post D-Day now that it triggers my memory. Yeah, it is strengthened because they strengthened them after this. They didn't really use them very much. I don't think ever again in combat. They used them in Italy in the Second World War. And there's plans to use them in the East, but they never do it because they don't end up doing the landing. Yeah, they use... Oh, that's right. Hold on. Where to go, Kevin? Yes, and thank you, Kevin, for hanging out today. Um, yeah, PD thirty eight. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> you know, the the mosquito and the in the P thirty eight are fast, so fast, um, so bloody fast, and they can do these things without taking fire. Um, well, they, they can take fire, but they're hard to do that, especially when there's other things going on. Um, there's tons going on in terms of that, and there's all kinds of stuff, and you're worried about friendly fire. So the faster you go, the better. Uh, are the waters off Normandy D-Day Beach is considered a maritime grave as far as I know no but I don't know officially maybe I don't know I don't think they're got any sort of designation I, I think because of the Prince of Wales and Repulse has been in the news lately from people trying to steal stuff well they are taking it um, they are taking it for scrap and there's a, one of the 14 inch guns is sitting in some scrapyard somewhere in Malaysia I think it was Malaysia uh, anyway, uh, but as far as I know, I don't know of any official designation. I mean, it's still active. People are still using it. Um, ports are still all used. F fishing is still is a major industry in Normandy. Great seafood, by the way. If you're Normandy, if you're a seafood fan, go to Normandy for that. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's it's really really good stuff. Um, but again, I don't know if there's like an official designation. Uh, I'm sure the ships are, but I don't think all of it is right because it's still active. People still live on the beach. People go there for vacations and everything and all that stuff. So, yeah, and Norma's right. Um, um, yeah, you can't tell anybody in advance or give away the game, which is not good. You don't want that. Yeah, and this is, I assume you're talking about uh, Repulse and Prince of Wales. Phil. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh yes, and they did do them at the uh, uh, crossing of the Rhine, but I don't think the first is ours that were under fire. I think they come over later, but they're still using them. Um, as for the crossing of the Rhine. Um, yes, that's right. I forgot about that. And yes, they were. I think the Americans used them and some of the British units. Not in numbers like D-Day, but they are using them. Uh, uh, that, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Um, we'll see. Um, I saw Jim Park in the Netherlands in May. I think he's going. I could be wrong, but I think he might be going. He might be there today. I don't know. The Juno Beach Center today or earlier today for them. Not entirely sure. 
Yeah, that's as far as I know. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, as they've, uh, they've tried to, uh, they have, they have taken chunks of the repulse and uh, Prince of Wales. Okay, so now I've cut up real quick, and I can't hold this very long because it's so heavy, and probably see it just from the shaking of the desk. But this is a model of the Holy Roller. I've done a video on this, talked about it a bunch. So it is a tank of the first Azars that lands in Normandy and fights all the way to VE Day, May 8th, 1945. Um, so what this is, oh, it's 25 pounds. <laughs> and I'm still sore from doing some yard work. <laughs> um, so what this is, is part of the tread on the bottom here, the original tread of um, Holy Roller. So it underwent a major reno uh, with the work that the First Azars Museum did. Um, and uh, Fancher College, another one of my alma maters, um, they got the students to redo it. So they took the old treads, they had to be replaced because they were in really, really rough shape. This is really a workout to hold. So you can see the front. So we're talking about the hatches, right? Earlier, sorry, one second. Yes, this is very heavy. <laughs> this is about 25 pounds, um, very condensed. So you can see the hatches there, right? Why is this so hard to do? Um, yeah, so there it is there. You can see the hatches in the front for the driver and co-driver and for the machine gun in the front, the little bobble there is the machine gun position. And then the hatch on the top for the driver and the, or sorry, for the commander and the loader. And then the back and underneath is the crest, which is fighting me. It's upside down. Oh man, this is heavy. Uh, so this is it. So I had to put this down. It's killing me. <laughs> oh, so yeah, so I've got that on my desk now. So that's pretty awesome. So that's one of my connections. I have to D-Day. I got that for Christmas. Just finally got it because they got tons of orders, which is amazing. The people wanted them. It's so good. Oh, get them around my arms. Woo. Stretch it out. Um, yeah, so so that's really cool to have a piece. Um, uh, that's really cool to have a piece of D-Day and Canadian history and London history on, on me, with me at all times now. It's really, really cool. I'm really excited to have that and have that great reminder. And I do actually use it as a paperweight, Rob, <laughs> because I'm right by a window on this side. Uh, right here is a window. My desk is here. Um, and if it gets windy, I just shove the papers underneath because they ain't going nowhere. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool. It's extremely well done with the casting that they did coming from a tread, right? This is not um, um, made of something else. Like it's heavy. I don't think it's lead. I think it's steel, straight up steel. I could be wrong. Sorry for those who know more about the the uh, um, the actual tank instructions and things like that down to the individual pieces, but I'm pretty sure it's just steel. Um, heavy, very, very heavy. Because it's just so condensed. I had to like pretend I wasn't struggling to carry this thing onto the up the stairs on the train, so it didn't look like I was carrying more weight than I was. <laughs> but I got it all the way back from London on the train, which was quite the endeavor. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show that. That's really cool. Uh, I'm really glad to have that piece with me. Yes. So, yes, I, earlier today, there's a short I did. I think that's the one you're talking about. Um, um, sorry, I'm just getting distracted again, talking about the wildfires that are hitting us. Uh, yes, uh, they capture some Germans on the beach. Lots, actually. Quite a few number of Germans on the beach are taken. Um, they're in the, the, the bunkers, command bunkers, that are outside the Juno Beach Center, which I have Sure, a few of you did those virtual tours they did a while back. I think it was in the last year. Um, and I'm not sure where that stands with that project. Uh, but, yeah, so there were some in there, and they just kind of flushed them out and took a huge number of POWs. Um, there's another shorts and other videos I have of all the beaches having German POWs on them, up and down, sold uh, from Gold, Sword, Juno, Omaha, and Utah. The Germans were captured at all of them, and the defenses behind them in the immediate areas. Um all that stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's crazy. And I did a video about, um, uh, how this, this people seem to think that there was an order across all of the allied expeditionary force that any POWs taken on D-Day were to be executed. I don't know why people think that it's not accurate. Even the paratroopers weren't told to do that. Some claim that they were told to do that just, but they were getting on board from a commander or an NCO or something. Um, that's not true in most of the cases. It comes from a handful of individuals and now people, particularly neo-Nazis and people who really, really love supporting what Germany was doing in World War II, take that as an example of how the Allies were bad because supposedly they told them to kill all, um, 
um, POWs, which is not true. It took so many. I mean, there's a, I don't know if I have it on the channel anymore, but a, 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 a bunch of uh, POWs standing around waiting to get taken off and go back to England, to go to England um, by the old train station in, in, in uh, Bernays or Mare. And this local comes up, grabs a helmet. I don't know what's that because there's no sound. He just picks it up and then slams it back down in front of the Germans. Um, um, so it's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, so yes, a ton of them were, were taken. And yes, not all of them were Germans. Hold on. Uh, Pat here is correct. Uh, not all were Germans. Um, you have uh, Sudeten Germans who are technically Czechoslovakian, I suppose, pre-war international law. Um, you have Russian POWs who fight as part of those battalions that are uh, recruited in the POW camps and sent to the West to help defend. You have um, slave laborers, all that nasty stuff that the Germans did. Um, good chunk of those fought in that area, but um, yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, a lot of POWs were taken. Sorry, I just want to see if I missed something up here. So you guys are talking about the fires. Yeah, they're hitting us here. I didn't want to uh, open any of the windows because they're not great for, um, yeah. Yes, I've heard about this. Sorry, just going back to talking about scrap because um, it's from the pre, from the bombings. Um, yeah, particularly from the um, the naval wrecks at Scapa Flow, especially because there was no atomic detonation yet. So it's good for that. Um, Scapa Flow has been done, been used all the time um, from the German fleet, uh, but that's not a grave, right? I don't, I don't think anybody was, it could be wrong. Um, usually, there's usually one or two people that get killed when these things happen, but it was just a scuttling of the fleet. Um, it wasn't like a battle grave or anything like that. Yeah, the weather here is awful. Um, really smoky. I didn't open a single window today just because of that. Like it looks like the sun is perpetually, you know, setting as you normally see it here, but because of the smoke, it's awful. Because I'm just west of Quebec. Yeah, it's steel. I, I figured as much. I get uh, confused. <laughs> it's heavy. It's super heavy, so it's legit. Yeah, it would be steel because uh, most of it's made of steel. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, Yes, they did. Um, they brought them across. They had been bringing them across uh, the entire war, actually. Um, there had been POWs from the, you know, the Luftwaffe, the Kriegsmarine, had been in Canada for a very long time. Uh, POWs taken during the Battle of Britain are sent to Canada. One famously escapes, gets back out, crosses the Chan crosses the Atlantic, and uh, rejoins Luftwaffe and gets killed again. Gets killed. Uh, I talked about that as a, a post a while back. Uh, but yeah, lots of them. Uh, my grandfather remembers seeing them because he grew up around the Windsor, uh, Windsor, Detroit area. <clears throat> so heavily agricultural still is. And they used the Germans as, as labor. Uh, not slave labor because they paid them. They pay them great, but they paid them based on the international law and the agreements and everything. Um, and not necessarily some of the guys he saw, but some of the German POWs enjoyed their time in Canada so much they eventually came back. You don't hear that about the other way. Not too many allies enjoyed their stay in the Axis prison camps and decided to emigrate to those countries. The Germans did, though, in the United States, Canada, and Britain as well. Yeah, that happens. That happens, and all armies do that at some point or another. Um, but yeah, there's many documented cases of the Germans doing that. Yeah, you guys are safe, okay? And you guys are you guys should be okay where you are in Nova Scotia, but it's it's rough. Uh, yeah, it's rough. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Jack, thanks for making a live one. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, well, with Royal Oak, that's different. I think the, the steel they take is from the German fleet after the First World War, not the Royal Oak, um, because the German fleet, you know, sails into Scapa Flow uh, at the armistice and then is scuttled um, at, just after Versailles signed or just before. Um, something to do with the peace agreement, and they scuttle the fleet, so the Brits can't have it. And as it turns out, it doesn't really make a difference anyway, as we know later on.
Yeah, that does not surprise me at all, Pete. I've heard that story as well. Um, my dad worked with a few guys who were POWs uh, and served actually in the German army. One was an Austrian. Um, yeah, they did not get treated very well. So, yes. So, yeah. Uh, so it's called the battle. I should do a video on this one at some point. Um, um, the Battle of Bowmanville is because there's a POW camp outside Bowmanville, Ontario, which is just outside Toronto uh, and what is called the Greater Toronto Area today. Um, it, it's a POW camp and they have sort of an uprising because um, these uh, camps are guarded by the Veterans Guard of Canada, which are First World War veterans who have volunteered to do home defense or this kind of thing. Uh, so they kind of just started as basically a revolt and trying to take over the camp. And they had made, you know, it was like a prison revolt, you know, weapons and ships and all that kind of good stuff. I think there's a crossbow was made by one of them. It's in the war museum. It's crazy. Uh, until they bring the, you know, the local, the local battalion in to suppress it. And it kind of dies down. I don't know too many details, details about like the, the, the actual nitty gritty, but uh, yeah, it's a fascinating story. And that would totally make a cool video one day. Late in the sorry, I'm just reading this from the Fighting Canuck. Oh, well, that's uh, with a picture from Very Ridge, I see. Um, opening of Mark Zilke's holding Juno started with the shut ears taking on an attack late on the night of the sixth. Do you know anything about this? Not not too much. Um, I just know that there's that famous halt order in Second Army, British Second Army. Uh, hold your positions, everyone, hold your positions where you are. Um, and there was, I don't know if there was like a full out attacks. I know the Germans were probing the lines, especially when the 12th SS starts to show up. Um, the attacks begin. I don't know too much about the details about that. Unfortunately, I have, because uh, I want to cover another story in a bit here. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I have, uh, I don't have that word diary in front of me, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, there was scattered fighting throughout the night. It's not like everybody took the night off, but uh, the next stuff starts the next day, right? When the 12th SS are able to bring up their armor and really start to hammer back some of it anyway, not all of it, like Biron and, and Ati and all that stuff. But uh, the shoddy here, as far as I know, they don't get thrown back in any major way. Well, thank you for the uh, super chat, Laurel. I really appreciate that. And that's going into the pot for the project. So thank you so much. Um, it makes, again, dollar, one dollar, one euro, one pound, whatever makes a huge difference. So thank you so much. Um, really, 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 really helpful. Yes, a lot of Italian POWs did stay in Scotland after the war, which is really interesting. Uh, I, don't know, I just think these funny these stories are hilarious and great and how people get taken as a POW and then just like it so much they end up staying. I mean, the Canadians, in some cases, they let them roam free. They let them shop and go into stores and get stuff for farmers and they gave them money and none of them ran. A, there's nowhere to go, especially after the United States declares war. You can probably starve to death in the bush, which you will, or you'll freeze to death in the Canadian wilderness. So there's not really anywhere to go, and they're paying and feeding you and all this good stuff. While well, your homeland is, you know, murdering millions and getting destroyed. Uh, so not really technically a battle, I guess, I guess you could say, but they're not combatants anymore. So no, not technically. Um, there's no battle on Canadian soil. In that regard, there's fighting in the St. Lawrence um, with the U-boats. There's a German, sorry, a Japanese submarine shoots at a lighthouse on Vancouver Island and misses. I like to say the only thing they hit is the ground. They tried to hit a lighthouse and failed. Um, yeah, that didn't uh, didn't go well. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like a riot, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, they flooded them out with hoses. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think any shots are fired, but yeah, they, they did the old, you know, prison tricks, you know, beatings and such. <laughs> the, the beatings will continue kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Um, uh, the Fallschirmjäger were, you know, infamous for their tough exteriors. Not all of them. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Alex has been looking at the, the Bowmanville stuff, so that'd be great. Uh, so, Norma, we're going to get to that. I'll get back to that, actually, okay? Uh, if that's okay, because i got to tell an American story. I'm just trying to get... You guys have so many um, great questions and insights. Um, 
we'll get to Cardinville. And I showed this on Twitter the other day, but here's a piece of the wall. Yeah, they stay off and because they met a girl. Sometimes some of them did, some of them been after. I mean, that's war stories, right? Some of the Canadians war brides, um, some stay, some come back, some go over there, whatever. It's it's people move around a lot. Um, yeah, war is crazy for these kinds of things, and people do, and lots of men do lots of things for for the girl they've met, right? I'm sure, many of us have. That's a good question, Sean. Um uh, sort of, not really. I mean, if there's interest, we can ask around. Um, it's an idea. It's an interesting idea. It's something that we could all give us something to discuss and we can do it privately. Um, if people are interested, I'd very much be willing to organize that. I could curate it and we could do it that way or whatever. I mean, we got you know, librarians, historians here, right? And people are very interested. So if there is an interest, we could definitely do that. And I, I have some in mind already, actually. Yeah, book club would really be cool. No, not yet, Chris. We keep people got lots of good questions, um, and don't just read about it in Stacy. There's much better out there. <laughs> Mark Milner's book is better than Stacy on Cardinville, much better. Oh, okay, so maybe yeah, they just fired some warning shots at Boatmanville or something. Oh, yeah, there's POW camps all over Canada, all over the United States. They're everywhere. Um, tons of them. Uh, lots and lots and lots. <laughs> I don't have the news. Are you talking to me? <laughs> um, yes. Um, yeah, there's uh, lots of if someone if people want to do that, that's that's very cool. Okay, so if this is okay with everybody, I'd like to move to the next story. Just give me one second here. I just gotta find where I put the thing. One second. You have too much going on here. Okay, I guess not. Okay, so one moment. Bear with me. Simpsons reference. That's a Simpsons reference? What from what? I should know this. Please tell me the episode. Anyway, sorry, continuing. I got distracted. So another story I found quite a while back. Uh, I don't know exactly when. Um, was it from this guy? So this is Major Stanley Bach. Uh, really, really interesting story. So he lands um, at Omaha Beach. He is part of, and I'll move forward here. So I think it's just a great picture of him. Uh, I'll reference it. I'll put the link down below where I found it for all this stuff after. I got some of it up. I just didn't want to get some of it away. Built the suspense, get the audience going. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so he's uh, lands at Omaha Beach, not in one of the first waves or anything like that. Um, so we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll get to it in a second. So I'll, hopefully you can read that. Hopefully it's not too, too small. I can't really fight with it too, too well. So uh, just reading off of here is, is Bach is a liaison officer to the 1st U.S. Army um, for the 1st Division, but he's attached to the headquarters, advanced headquarters of the 29th Infantry Division as it lands at Omaha Beach on D-Day. So he originally writes out his day, what happens. It's kind of like a date book. Um, uh, things like that. Um, it's, it's really cool because it's it, they don't have the originals. I'm sure they do at the National Archive, but one of them, I'm not sure. Maybe you can't see them now because of this. But he just kind of writes them down on pages from kind of like a little, called a memorandum book, probably like a notebook. Um, and then three envelopes that he tears open so he can write more. So I assume he's doing this on the beach. Um, um, you know, all that stuff. No, David, I cannot start over for you. The yep yeah, got mentioned, though. Maybe that's what brought you forth. Um, um, yeah, you guys have enough questions. <laughs> Maybe we don't need a book. Well, we could frame it around a book. Uh, we could do that that way, actually. That'd be really cool. I can't start again. I, I'm too far in. We're in the middle of an Omaha story. Um, anyway, so it says here, yeah, he writes it on an envelope just to cover his thoughts. So I assume he's doing this. He talks about it um, as he's moving through. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, um, we only, we, um, what do we say, do you have once? And he appears. Uh, anyway, so the original notes are the ones in capitals. So like you can see here, it, uh, 
zero uh, three ten breakfast, right? So that's what his original one. So I think this is really cool. That just kind of gives a blow by blow, literally what's happening. So you can see he's up for D Day at two thirty breakfast. The barrage starts a quarter to six. Um, H hour is six twenty five for Omaha Beach earlier than at Juno. Uh, he gets into the landing craft at eight thirty. <laughs> he just puts literally very rough sea. Uh, coming in from a mile offshore, waiting to get in. So he lands, he says, at 10.10, uh, ramp down, ankle deep, wonderful handing of craft, landed at St. Laurent-sur-Mer on Easing Green Beach. Uh, and then in, pretty much immediately pinned down by rifle and artillery fire. Uh, down to see General Wham, part of uh, the division. Um, so first division up St. Laurent Point to Strong Point and the Navy Shelled Point. So they're working their way up the cliffs. Uh, as they're taking these positions. So they have to dig in because they're still taking fire from in behind. Um, you know, they're, they're still taking German fire and rifle fire and machine gun fire. Uh, so they have to dig in um, for this advanced HQ that he's part of. Um, so he digs in five feet deep with a, a two-foot stone wall in behind. So he's very much dug in, uh, and this is not the end of the story. So they're taking mortar, rifle, 88, and machine gun fire so heavy on beach. It's either get to the ridge and back of the beach or being killed. So you have to take your time. You have to go as quickly as possible across this beach to get up into this position that they've taken. Uh, sorry, I had a map. I couldn't find it in, in, in the limited time I had. So I apologize for that. I wish I could pull that up um, for where all of this is. Um, but uh, um it's uh, it's really, really uh, an interesting story, and you can find this stuff um, on a Google map as well. Sorry, one second. I'm getting, getting thirsty again. So led a group of 15 men through minefield. At, sorry, this is 1145. And waited water, uh, knee, water knee deep to hillside, dug in gully, two feet short of crest, safe there as no mortar or 88 fire could possibly hit us. Um, so they're in behind in that. And yes, this is where the fields are more inundated than we were talking about with Juno. <clears throat> so noon, beach, high tide, bodies floating, many dead Americans on beach at high water mark. Uh, 1215, heavy motor and 88 fire started on beach from east end to west end. Series of five shells and spots. Direct hit on Sherman tank. Men out like ra rats, those alive. <clears throat> 1230, LCT hit two mines, came on in, hit third, dis, uh, hit third, disintegrated, and rear end sunk. At burst of shell, two Navy men went flying through the air into water, never came up. 1250, saw a captain, infantry, pull five men to shore out of water. <clears throat> uh, 1300, tide going out, uh, now Rhino Ferry in, but bursting shells forced it to go back out at sea after unloading two vehicles. So this is... Um, those flat barges basically that they are able to load up some of the heavier stuff on and bring those in when the beach is supposed to be better secured. Clearly it was not. So they had to back out. Saw a direct hit on beach uh, on beach, sorry, uh, landing craft uh, motor uh, flames everywhere. LCM. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm blanking on the end. I think it's motor um, for landing uh, vehicles. Um, sorry. Uh, flames everywhere. Men burning alive. Beach now can be seen. By aid of glasses, entire distance about two miles east, two miles west, with tide slowly going out. Long runnels, so where the water's coming down through the sand, uh, appear in beach. Also obstacles with deli teller mines on top of beach. 1,400, fire on beach increasing. Aid men go to help man that was a uh, machine gun, but hit by bullet himself. Another aid man pulled him back to foxhole. Uh, 1430, just heard from above that Captain T. Ernest of 115th Infantry, 116 question mark, is above us in field hit by bullet. Four aid men go out, get him. He comes back smiling despite shoulder wounds, says, get two Jerry's for him. <laughs> All right, keeping that humor up. 1440, more, more mortar fire, more men are hit. Uh, LCVP, so Higgins boat, unload five loads of men. They lie down on beach, mortar fire kills five of them. Rest up and run for foxholes we left a couple hours ago. Snipers in large brick house on beach only 50 yards from the high water mark. Keep men in holes. 1520, direct hit on two and a half ton truck. Gas line, gasoline load. Canvas flames, another catches fire. Then entire load goes up. 
Area 100 yards square, men's clothes on fire. Attempt to roll in sand to put out flames. Some successful, others die in flames. 1540, infantry moving by U.S. US up path over crest. Oh, up path over the crest. Moving forward, we endeavor to move on. MG holds us up for a few minutes. Then lifts. We get to open field, follow a path, see one man that has stepped on mine, no body from waist down, just entrails and chest organs. 1600, we reach wood through uh, we reach wood through field 500 yards from top of cliff. We just came up. See men on knees. We think he is praying or scared. Roll him over. He is dead. Died on knees praying. 1630, barbed wire, mines, mortars, MG, rifle 88, fire very, everywhere it seems. Prayed several times. Why do these things have to be have to be forced upon men? Uh, Sixteen fifty, reach town of Saint Laurent, three quarters of a mile, three quarters of a mile from the beach. Snipers holding up our advance. Established CP, and saw first time the first division friends who were quiet, fighting, fighting mad, and give me heart too. Seventeen hundred, prisoners begin to come up road. A sorry looking bunch in comparison to our well fed and equipped men. 1800, still plenty of gunfire and distance. Mortar fire and orchard where CP was caused all it to dig in or get behind trees, stumps, or ditches. And the PS is quite the uh, uh, intense uh, part of this uh, element here. Is I've seen movies, assault training demonstrations, and actual battle, but nothing can approach the scenes of the beach from 1130 to 1400 hours. Men being killed like flies from unseen gun positions. Navy can't hit them. Air cover can't see them. So infantry had to dig them out. So, so that's a really, really intense story, um, really told in the most basic way possible from um, from Stanley Bach. Uh, it's such an intense story. I've been sitting on that one for a while. Um, wasn't really sure what to do with it. I thought today was a good place to share it. Uh, maybe, again, I can do something with that later. It's just, again, these things take time to do them properly. Um, so that's just a really intense story, especially that... Uh, at the end there. So I can only assume he's doing these notes, I think, because, uh, sorry, yeah, Susan asks here. Um, having a good memory or taking notes. Again, he's got that memorandum sheets. He's got those envelopes. I assume he's doing it as he's moving. That's why I'd love to see the originals, right? Because sometimes you can get a sense of what's happening and, you know, what's going on from handwriting, right? And 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 you get a sense of things. Sometimes it's more frantic and harder to read. Sometimes it's more calm and put down. Again, I don't know for sure because this is uh, added to later, but as, oh, hold on, I'll bring it back up. You can see that some of it, right, is, sorry, I got too much going on. Open here. Um, okay. Like you can see most of this is in caps, right? The caps was written at the time. So whatever at the time means, um, most of it is written at the time. So um, I'm assuming the day of that this is going on. Like, this is intense. Like, this is, I've never heard this story before. Um, uh, like, I was very, I, I put in uh, his name and, you know, searching it through, you know, first U.S. Army and then each individual division with the 29th and the 1st and then Omaha. and Hardly anything returns on this guy. Uh, I found the picture because it's linked to his Find a Grave page. Um, he dies in 1980 something. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but th that's where I found the picture of him, and it's labeled. So that's that's fantastic to have a labeled photo of him. It very much looks like the American officer of the Second World War, and I mean that in a really really good way. Um, yeah, so it's uh, um, so yeah, it's really really interesting. It's a great story, great um, uh, primary document, like 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 uh, Dave O'Keefe had just said. Um, I've never seen this or heard this before. Um, so yeah, I really wanted to share it because I know a lot of you are Americans and I just want to share military history, right? So it, it's great to be able to, to share this one particular story. It's just, it's so intense. Like I would love to be able to piece that all together and try to find other documents and other things that connect to everything that he's seeing. Like that's what I was going to do. And then again, as a lot of you know, I just, I ran out of time. Um, yeah, unfortunately. So yeah, sorry, I was really focusing on that one at the end, so I'm going to have to work my way um, back up. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying the uh, the format, Phil. I was a little worried you guys weren't going to like it, 
Um, just because I, I got one more story I do want to tell. Um, that's in the hopper. Uh, some had other ideas. I don't know if someone watching, someone had to go back to work or are coming off work, whatever. Um, I was just able to put some of these together um, um, for today. Uh, but yeah, it's great. Yes. Uh, and another thing. So now that we're kind of into, what are we in now? We're almost an hour and a half in. Um, it's great. It, it, it's a great way to support if you do want to buy the link, the books or whatever from when people come on and um, or if I'm talking about a book or whatever, I can link them low. Uh, and if you do want to buy them, buying them through my link also helps me because I get a, a chunk of that. And it just helps again the channel and we'll go towards the big project, uh, the Normandy project that I will be working on. Um, again, the more support it gets, the better the project will be. Uh, if I can't get over there, it won't be as good as I can make it, right? I'll be here in Canada using the resources I have. Um, so so that's what it'll be. But so the more support it gets, the better the project will be. Um, so yes, Amazon links is a great way to do. But again, you don't have to get them through that. You can get most of the ones that I'll probably recommend. If we do do this, I have one actually. Where to go? This is one of the ones I would suggest because it's a fantastic book. Ah, here we go. From, from, from Charlie Martin with the uh, Queen's Own. Talked about it before. Did more memoir show. Show, sorry. Yeah, uh, and it was. It's a fantastic book. I like his style because it's it's kind of like the, the 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 Bach piece there, very visceral, very plainly spoken in a clear way. It's hard to what I'm trying to say there. It's just very well done in that way. It's not literary. It's not you know adding flowery language like a certain other Canadian author who was also a veteran may have done in a couple of cases. It's just it's a little different, and that's why I like it. So yes, I'm glad it's, you're enjoying the format, and, and I could always do these in the future. Yeah, you guys definitely don't need help with questions. <laughs> yes, I think we said DF too many times, um, and then he hears us from says, "Here's me in Ottawa," and it travels across to the Montreal area, and he comes. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Yeah, Rob, that's great too. That includes the breakfast. That struck me too. It's like, yeah, for breakfast, and now the bombardment starts. <laughs> like it's it's crazy. Oh, thanks for coming out, Marks and Sparks. Appreciate it. Yes, it's it's Alex's fault technically for bringing it up. Uh, I don't know if it was a real one. Um, um, but yeah, under fire doesn't really make a difference. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Not in the open like that. Sorry, I'm just catching up here. Yeah, it's brutal stuff. I mean, this is the stuff that, and not in a morbid way, but you just, this is the, this is war, right? Box talking about guy they think is just praying and he's dead or the guy who got ripped in half like this is not good like this is war that's what war is it's this nasty business as i say often i don't try to say it but that's just how it comes out when i'm talking about this stuff like this is the things that stick with me or like from first world war war diaries where i've read same thing a guy was trying to get up a trench and then got blown in half and his arms were still clinging onto the parapet like it's just it's nasty stuff this isn't glory this isn't an adventure. This is this is death. This is dangerous. This is awful, and we shouldn't avoid it at all costs. Yeah, it sounds like Woody was on another channel doing a bunch of stuff with uh, what is it, time wheel, time wheel, ghost wheel, something like that. Sorry, just. Uh, Oh, really? Oh, Nicholas, I didn't know you lived that close to the... Yeah, another site I should go to. I go by all the time. I should probably stop by some point. Sorry, I'm just catching up. Oh, honeymoon. Nice. Oh, congratulations. Uh, honeymoons are amazing. Hope you have an awesome time. Sorry, you guys are 
going crazy fast. Hey, Jeff, thanks for showing up. Yeah, Time Ghost, that's it. I don't know. Someone else is called Time Wheel on World, uh, that watches World War II TV. <laughs> I only have so much room for so much information. Uh, yeah, so so that's the box story. It's intense. Um, maybe I can parcel that one out as well. Um, but uh, it's definitely one I want to share because it's just, what, four pages? Um, it's it's intense. Um, and just such a, that visceral, you know, that PS part is just, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, so, um, and I'll link it down below after as well. Um, I just didn't get a chance to grab it yet. So yeah, it's just four pages and it's, it's just crammed with information. Uh, so another thing I did want to bring just quick here, uh, and because if Norm is still with us, um, watching with us, um, I don't remember actually, hold on, let's see what order I put things in. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, there's one thing I want to talk about. So yeah, real quick, I can come back to this after, but, uh, um, this, like, I grabbed it from, obviously it's from the official history, um, by, uh, by Stacy and the victory campaign, but it, it, it was on the Juno beach website. They've cobbled these all together and high res scanned them. So it's great. And you can really see the details here of, of Juno. Um, yeah, so it's an amazing map. I just wanted to bring this to people's attention, uh, how to find it and, uh, and where I got it from. Cause sometimes the scans, well, I mean, the government scans of, uh, of the official histories are not great for maps. They're not high quality. So you, stuff gets lost. Uh, you lose it. Um, but Juno Beach Center has done these ones for the Canadian Assaults, other ones. They've had other maps put together, obviously, and all that other stuff. So this one's really good because it really shows the details of Juno and then on the flanks as well with the with the British divisions, the 3rd and the 50th, which adds confusion because there's the 3rd British division and then the 3rd Canadian division <laughs> fighting side by side with the 50th. Um, yeah, it's a great map. So I just want to bring that to attention. It shows everything and how it – where is my mouse? Um, or it develops the different lines that are supposed to be taken, named after trees, because you have the U line, the Elm line, and then the Oak line is the railway that's supposed to be taken um, on the first day. It's not. It goes into the second day on the 7th is when these advances happen. They push up to um, Puto, uh, Brettville, um, and Nori, actually. So they push past parts of it. Um, and then supposed to get into Carpe K, which doesn't fall until much later, until July. Um, and then there's the advance into Ati, which I wasn't going to talk about too, too much, um, just because it's such a sad and awful, awful story. Um, and the, the actions of the 12th SS and the execution of numerous POWs, not even just at uh, the Abbey de Arden, <coughs> excuse me, outside there, um, but in... Um, Athi itself, the murdering of Canadians in Biran, the, the, the straight up executions of wounded and POWs. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, um, it's an awful, awful story. I did a piece about it in the Juno Beach Center. I can link that. Um, I, I was going to talk about it today, but I don't I don't think I really want to because um, we're supposed to have Phil in the channel yesterday. So just let you uh, sorry, tomorrow, uh, Phil Blood talking about this, um, but we'll have him back. Uh, he's just had some family things. He's he's. Um, dealing with at the moment currently. So we'll have him uh, rescheduled to come on and then we'll talk about it. Um, we'll talk about it then and there um, and all the stuff that goes on with that. And I'm sure a lot of uh, you know about that. Yeah, so the talk is not tomorrow. Um, it, it has been postponed. I'm not sure of the date yet. I said, Phil, don't worry about your personal stuff first. Don't worry about me or the show or anything else. Just take care of yourself and your family. Um, and uh, we'll reschedule it and I'll be sure to let everyone know through all the usual uh, channels. So, um, yeah, so we'll talk about that and, and later on. And But that, again, uh, we can talk about the series, but that would be part of the series, right? There would be stuff on the Abbey trying to locate the other places where Canadians were known to have been executed, um, the other places where the uh, um, the 12th SS had HQs and the hotel. And uh, this, it's not on this map? Uh, no, not this one. Um, it's on another one further to the south where the other places where they were um, separated and executed. And there's some places in fields and stuff, particularly along the Oak Line, which is the railway line, uh, which is still there. Um, yeah, so all that stuff that's going on with, with Brettville. And uh, yeah, so all that kind of stuff. So yes, we'll get Phil on for sure. And we will talk about that and how it's been commodi you know, it's been commercialized and turned into a commodity of this SS worship nearly. Uh, I mean, I got another comment on uh, a video I did, but somebody else's, I said that the, the, the SS were not elite. And this guy, what do you say? Learn history troll. And I went, I have a PhD in it. Do you? Um, so 
apparently are a troll. If you say the SS aren't elite, not even saying that they're bad murderers or terrible people or whatever, just saying they're not elite makes you a troll. So this is kind of why I don't want to talk about it because it'll just get me all worked up. Uh, anyway, so that's just an aside for great sources. Um, real quick, and I know it's a bit of a cliche when it comes to Normandy, is Point the Hawk. These are from 2016. So as far as I know, there's been more erosion. Um, the actual part that's sticking out here um, has had more fallen off, unfortunately. Um, and it seems like more will go anytime now. Um, again, I haven't been there in quite a long time. Um, um, it's been uh, um, uh, falling apart. It's been cut. It's been fenced off as far as I know. You can't really get to much of it anymore. Um so I just wanted to share these photos because I was going through some other uh, Normandy photos that I took a while back. And this was a striking place to go um, because, again, as far as I know, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong that some of it's fenced off now. I don't. I, could, I hope I'm wrong. But I think it's uh, um, <laughs> PhD in trolling. Sorry. I mean, no, I, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um yeah, I mean, it was weird. Uh, I don't know what that means. I was called a troll for saying the 12th. Or, sir, the SS generally are not elite. I don't know what that means at all. Um, um, sorry, what was moved once? Bill? Oh, sorry, Philip? Well, I'm not sure. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting place to visit. I don't know what's still accessible and what's not. So this is as close as I got to the edge. Uh, it's as close as I could get at the time, um, near the bunker there where the memorial is in. Um, yeah, you can still. I don't know if it's from the time barbed wire, but there's still barbed wire, and it's very far down, very very far down. And gives you kind of a sense of what it was like up atop that position. Uh, and this is a terrible photo. I, I was the only one I had. Um, I think I was rushed trying to take it, but it's the only photo I have of the Ranger Memorial that's there. Um, yeah, I think, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was moved once before. Yes, you're right. Um, and I think they have to move them again um, because the erosion. I think the bunker might go in to the ocean. I mean, it's not the only place that's happened. It's happened to you a bunch of places. Uh, some of those post-42 um, fortifications have literally fallen off cliffs and are now sitting at the tide marks. Um yeah, it's, 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 that's what it is. That's time, right? Time moves forward and this is what happens. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's point to Hawk. Um, it really stuck with me. Um, that's why I wanted to include it um, and all of that stuff. Sorry, I'm just reading Jeff's comments here. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's uh, some of those places are difficult to walk around with. Like the app is so difficult to walk around with nothing on you. Well, imagine doing that under fire, wet, and stressed, and all that stuff. It's crazy. Okay, so this is Cartonville. So this is another story that stuck with me. I don't think Scott Beaterly is watching. He talked about this, and I can link it after. Um, and I can link the spot where he starts talking from a live stream we did a while back now. It would have been 20, I think it was 2022. No, no, 2021, sorry. 2021 for Remembrance Day. Um, oh, thanks, Scott. Thanks for... Um, uh, coming and hanging out. I appreciate it and all your support for the channel. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. So, so Scott talk, came and talked about this action and the Regina rifles period are generally and stuff about the, um, uh, the liberation of the Abbe Arden and the fighting that took place there and a relative of his. And anyway, he tells the story better than me. Uh, however, this is one part of the story. This is Cardenville farm. So I'm just going to, Give me one second here. Pull this back up. This is the map. And I probably should have just moved it. I didn't. Anyway, so you have, um, like I said, you have Puto, where there's fighting taking place and back and forth action, where here we're going to be focusing on what's taking place roughly here. So just north of the rail line or the oak line, as is designated in the planning. Um, it's called Cartonville Farm. I don't know if it was, it was a farmland, but there's farm buildings. I think it's, it was a factory. I think it's like a, a construction yard now. Um, apparently there's been some development going on along here. So it might look a little differently now. Uh, again, my photos are from 2016. Um, so this is the area we're talking about here. So it's, it's part of what they call the, 
the brigade fortress, right? Mark Milner, again, can't stress how good this book is enough. It's talking about this stuff uh, and all of this and Canada's role. And this is the perfect example of this because they set up. So the company of the Regina Rifles sets up in the buildings around uh, Cardinville Farm. Sorry, just give me one second here. So they set up in the position. So they have to ha basically help try to um, a setup is basically as a picket, right? To inform of what's coming uh, from the 12th SS because the 12th SS are coming up from down here and they're coming across here to try and hit Brettville, which they do. And I had Sean Claxton on talking about his excellent book. Uh, that's another live stream that's very popular and for a very good reason. Um, he did, and Sean did an excellent job talking about the fighting that takes place inside Brettville on the 8th and 9th. And, and all the crazy stuff that breaks out there. And there's actually, that reminds me of one part of that I do want to talk about, but we'll get there. Um, is going on here is the company is out trying to add to this fortress, trying to cover that flank so they can't come around. So they just launch numerous attacks at these buildings in, in, in Cardinville. Uh, they get around, they get into where the orchard is in behind uh, the tanks and they unfortunately crush a number of them to death by just running over the slit trenches. Again, it's nasty, nasty stuff um, of what happens here. So this is one of the main, uh, one second, one of the main, this is the main buildings of where they set up um, because there's many famous photos from this, sorry, um, area and we'll get there in a second. But this is the memorial that's set up at the place. It's not even marked on the map, which is unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> I don't think the people who own it want people poking around in there because it's like literally the entrance to the yard now. Um, and I didn't take a great picture and it's not in the best shape. I can't speak to it recently, but this is what it looked like at the time. Yeah, Very Hostile Night um, by Sean Claxton. It's a fantastic book. It's short. It's to the point in the best way possible. I uh, really enjoyed it. He sent me in advance <clears throat> a digital copy before it was available and I was just so enthralled by the way he did the story. Because he's a tour guide, like what do you back? Still does touring, uh, knows his stuff in that area and lives in Normandy. Um, so he knows his stuff. It was fantastic. So this is a chunk of the wall. Uh, it's been obviously updated and, and fixed from all the holes. Um, and before anyone accuses me of vandalism, so I, I grabbed pieces. Actually, hold on. One second. Uh, this was in the in the road, like that's a public road, or was it? The, oh, sorry. Hold on. <laughs> this here is the public road running along here. So it, that's the rail line in behind there. That's why there's a bit of a barrier back there. Uh, anyway, so these chunks of the brickwork uh, of the stonework. Hold on. On the wrong screen. Um, so you can see them here. We're just in the in the road, so I just grabbed them as kind of a souvenir to try and remember Cardinville, because I had been enthralled with the area originally. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, well, Scott left, but surprise, surprise, uh, because of the first is ours, right? Because Lieutenant Gordon Henry, this is where he takes up those five Panthers, right? I did a short on that uh, a while back. It's a story that doesn't get a ton of attention. Mark covers it expertly here. Um, it's in the war diary. It's very told in a very demure, down kind of Canadian military way of, yeah, that's just kind of what you do. He took up five Panthers and five shots with a firefly. Like, it's just crazy story. So that's how I got, because it takes place just outside of Cardinville. And that's how I got interested in this story. So I grabbed some, you know, souvenirs and ways to remember kind of what the Reginas did there and able to be part of that brigade fortress and stem parts of the SS advances trying to get to Brettville to hit the HQ of the Reginas to get them to force them out. Um, and again, uh, there's photos from in there. There's video of the place that I've used in other stuff. Um, it's interesting because you can kind of date the footage because there's the, the famous tower in um, in Brettville uh, itself, Lower Goose now. Um, they changed the name of the place now. It's like something I don't remember, can't pronounce. Um, it's a weird name. Uh, they've amalgamated the area uh, under a different name. Uh, anyway, so there's a tower, the, the church tower. It's a very tall one. Um, and you can tell by the damage it takes, what time the footage is from. Just gets, you know, it gets much worse. 
um, much, much worse over time. And you, that kind of way you can sort of date what you're looking at. Uh, anyway, so this is an intense fight at Cardinville. Um, they have to basically, um, they cut loopholes, and we'll get there in a second. You can see how what I'm talking about. But they have to stem the attack that's coming from here because this line here, you can see the power lines here. Uh, in behind that is an embankment. I know because I climbed over it <laughs> as we parked nearby on the other side um, just to get a lay of what it looked like. Um, well, you can buy a book online, Chris, if you want, and help me at the same time. <laughs> well, it's available online. It's available through Amazon. I can get you. I can link down below if you guys are interested in getting this book. I highly recommend it if you are interested in Canada's early days in Normandy. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we went to the other side to check out um, what it would look like for the advance for the SS coming along. What is the oak line or this pale line in behind? And there was a farm at the time. It looks like a little more built up on Google Maps as far as I can see. Um, but this is the area. This is the famous area of... Oh, I didn't put them in. One second. I'm just going to have to bear with me, everyone. I apologize. I thought I put them in. I guess I didn't. Sorry, interlude. Uh, chat amongst yourselves. They're just really cool photos. I'm sure you've seen them. They're not like hidden or anything. One second. So this one's one of the famous ones. Um, um, <laughs> we can't all be professional Woody here, can we? Or, uh, I'm doing this on the fly. Not like the other one where I did the anime, literally on the fly. We're supposed to have a guest and there was a hiccup. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm sure you've seen these photos where they cut the loopholes into the wall. As far as I can tell, it's still the same wall. It's just been patched up um, to, to stave off the SS attacks, right? Because they launch a armor attack at night uh, over on the night of the 8th um, before they make their way into um, Breadville. Um, but then in the day, the SS come in in the open, which we just saw, in this area, or from around this area, attacking this in the broad daylight. And then they get blown away by artillery because they just yet, they had uh, their carrier, their universal carrier, um, um, got hit by the attack and was destroyed. They eventually got back up online. Um, um, uh, and we're able to get the artillery in um, and, and take it out, take out the attack and stop them because they thought they were going to get overrun. Again, Scott talks about this um, um, in his live stream from way back. Uh, I'll talk to Scott and see if I can kind of piece that out from that one as well and kind of share that story because he does an excellent job with it. I'd love to do something with him on it as well. But uh, yeah, so this is a, a famous photo. You've probably seen it multiple times. It's, it's often mentioned as unnamed. Uh, the soldier is unnamed. Uh, at least it is marked in um, Library and Archives Canada as unnamed. Um, well, we can come up with a drinking game trigger if you like. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading this my chat here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it is for Archer. Uh, you should sell those with the book once that comes out. Um, uh, anyway, so that soldier is said as identified. Uh, but in um, Mark Milner's book, uh, he he finds the identity from somewhere. Uh, Daniel E. I'm probably saying this wrong. Daniel E. Korean. Korean. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, anyway, if you have uh, um, Sovereign the Panzers, it's in here. And talking about who it is. Um, and it, these photos come from after, obviously, after the action is over. Um, after the 12th SS have given up the attack and have moved on. Um, yeah, so so this is uh, um, uh, Cardinville Farm. I know it's not as much detail as you probably were hoping. Uh, Norma, I don't haven't done any real uh, insights or any more digging into it recently, unfortunately. As you know, I've got a lot going on to go. Um, and again, you can see this stuff in the War Diary. They talk about it very briefly. Um, the actions of D Company are hardly mentioned, unfortunately. Um, because there's a lot going on inside Breffield where the HQ is, right? There's so much um, going on 
with the 12th SS counterattacks in the area. I mean, that's, and I have a video on that already, uh, which you can also check out um, with um, location, right? I got the picture of the location has appeared in 2016 with the famous photo of the Panther that got taken out at close range with a Piat. Um, did all that, talk about the fighting there again, and, and, and Sean did an excellent um, um, Sorry, one second. Kevin, who knows way more about this than I do. I'm just reading it here. Skeptical of that idea. He's ID'd in the motor platoon photo from around Brettonville long before. A relative suggest him for the Curtinville photo. Okay, that makes sense. Um, um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, Mark mentions that in the book, that he is norm, uh, was originally part... Oh, I, I lost the page. No. Oh, uh, one second. Let's see if I can pull it back up again of the support platoon support company formerly it says formerly of the regina rifles support company stands in a slit trench behind the wall at cardinville farm on the 10th of june so maybe um but yeah so you would have been part of the motor platoon a mortar i can never say that properly on these things mortar platoon <laughs> um and i think i know the one you're talking about um, and there's footage of that as well um uh, of the mortar it was in the video i showed actually uh, at the beginning um, so yeah, you're probably, I, I mean, I, you know way more about this than I do, um, but it's an interesting thing um, to look at. Um, and with IDs and stuff, that's why I get kind of wary with them and I try not to do them um, too much other than, you know, when I'm trying to do a video or doing that thing or try to set apart from something else that someone else has said. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so, so that's a really cool story. Um, uh, yeah, so just going through... Um, these real quick. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of, this was one of the, uh, the drivers, one of the motivators um, uh, for the whole idea of the, o as I'm calling it now, the OTD Normandy project, Battle of Normandy or OTD Normandy project is things like Brettville, things like Cardinville Farm don't get that attention. They don't get told in a way that's engaging. Not that that Mark's book is not engaging, but everyone pretty much, unless you're new again, new or watching this later or somebody else, knows what I try to do, right? Try to get this to a wide audience. These books are not cheap. They're not easy to get, even from libraries nowadays. It's not easy. So trying to tell these stories in an accessible way, right? These videos are always free, and as long as you have an internet connection, you got them. You may have to watch ads, but you get them. So with that, you know, that's what I try to do here, is tell these stories that I think Norma said it on Twitter the other day, and Mark said it, and I've said it, and many of others have said it. If these stories were Americans or Brits or whatever, they would have been movies already, probably having remakes done of them. Like, this story is insane. Like, the range that that Piot is fired at, that Panther from in front of the Battalion HQ is, is just intense and so close. And, like, how he did it, he missed the first shot, didn't go through. The second one takes it out. He's able to reload that bloody thing in the dark while this is all happening and hits it like and the stuff that's going on curtain for farm it's just like what is going on here and it's got panther tanks and everything so anyway so that's why i kind of want to do this in the best way i know how i mean i'm not a filmmaker i'm not a hollywood writer i, can't, I don't have that i don't have much of a budget that's why i'm trying to get some interest in this and get some money to put some you know cash and fuse into this project to get it done properly which again would involve going to Normandy, going to this site again, going to where Henry takes out, where Gordon Henry takes out those Panthers, going to the beach, going to uh, the spot where the famous photo of David Curry is taken, and, and all that stuff. Like, that's how this is going to be to be done by Canadians. Uh, and again, not disparaging uh, this other, oh, sorry, I hit the wrong thing here. Um, Again, it's a great project. Lots of great people involved. They've asked me for a little bit of help. I just couldn't really, help, unfortunately, help them with the question they had. Um, it's it, it's going to be a great story, but it, it, it's got Canadians involved. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but it's going to be in a good way. But it, as I always say, and come this from from Tim Cook, is can Canadians don't tell their own stories for some reason? We don't. I don't know why. We just don't do it. Uh, we don't do them in depth. We don't do them in sort of any way that's engaging. Um, some people have, they've tried, they've been terrible or they're older and they're just not as easily accessible. They're done before the whole digital revolution. And some of the old resources they use are old and they're 
tainted by old historiography and things like that. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I want to do new, different, and accessible. So this is what I'm trying to do. And by a Canadian. Again, I'm not saying that non-Canadians can't do Canadian history. Or as I just saw him, Alex, who's doing Canadian stuff all the time in Canada now. We converted him and captured him. <laughs> we stole him from the Isles and he now lives out east. Um, it, 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 that's what I mean. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. I'm not disparaging saying I no one do it. I want other than many people to do. I want an Egyptian to do Canadian history. I want Tanzanians to do Canadian history. You know what I mean? It's just I want to do it for what I have. And I think most of you, I think this is preaching to the choir, but bring what I know and what I've done to a project like this, that it's going to need help. It's going to need anything anyone's willing to give um, insight or uh, it's, it's just, that's what I have at this point, And that's kind of what I'm hoping I can get, but uh, we got so many great stories and they just don't get told in ways that engage people. Like if I had time to sit down and make Gardenville farm video, man, the things I could do with that with, you know, document you know with footage from the site it would be fantastic uh mad weapon yeah it's something so british about that bloody thing you know right it's just the spigot motor <laughs> sling what did i saw once a meme online so world angry angriest slingshot which is true hey that could be another t-shirt um it's such a it's so crazy the, the, this thing a, is a pain in the butt to use but it worked right when it needed to be and it could be used in indirect fire and was and handheld and all this crazy stuff like it's it's got such a i think rightful place and how it's understood and kind of revered in a weird way um yeah it, it's crazy um i mean andreas we've talked about this before and i know you've seen the videos there's this whole historiography behind us this whole stuff behind why we tell the stories the way we do i don't like keep harping on it but the valor and the horror really changed how we saw um, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted because Angry Canuck just mentioned firing a peon. How and why and where can I do it? Um, it kind of, in things have changed. There was a change in the general historiography in the West, English speaking world about, you know, military stuff all being bad because of, you know, the Vietnam War and, and all of that. And the stories of the Second World War, which is probably the most, uh, you know, just war and modern memory. Uh, being bad now and we do that here we downplay it we don't like to talk about war it's not polite it's not canadian i've literally been said i asked a question a while back i think it was last year about yeah bingo there you go you're you're welcome i'll help you with your bingo for the what is it the lazy girls uh, podcast um i mentioned val in the horror because you know you can easily get it out of me um you know that kind of thing and we're i was literally told on about VE day like why isn't VE day celebrated we win we won we defeated nazism sort of still around Ugh. uh anyway um <laughs> it's just we we're like yeah we don't even mark it we, we, this massive national effort to do this and we just yeah whatever you know and not even mentioned and we don't celebrate because it's un-Canadian to, to, to gloat, to mention winning, not even gloat, to mention that we won. Hockey, no problem. Um, but anything of, you know, this value of real world impact is apparently bad. And I just, I don't get it. Um, I, I mean, I understand why it's developed the way it has and, and people have had their reasons, economic and monetary mostly, for their own careers to push these narratives of this isn't Canada, Canada's you know done bad things, blah blah blah. I'm not denying that Canada hasn't, but to say at some points that they were worse than the Germans or the Nazis and the German armed forces of the Second World War, which some people claim is insane, um, it's just like it just drives me crazy. I actually, yeah, I, I mean, Andreas, this is another reason why I I did you know OTD generally because. I face this, this whole modesty thing, or we don't talk about it. It's not polite. And, you know, again, you're German, you know what it's like. It's not disparaging Germans of today. I mean, I know lots of people from Germany. <laughs> I grew up, I knew people from Germany growing up and I've met others from Germany and Andreas now and other people. And I was just in Germany and it's not like that. I'm not saying it in that way. But people have said, oh, we're going to make Germans uncomfortable if we say like we won. I'm like, well, humanity won that one. Sorry, guys. We we're part of that. We defeated an evil, evil, evil people that were in charge of this stuff. Um, you know, it's just, anyway. 
it's just it's it's part of that and yeah we get left out longest day did huge damage um and left us out of the d-day story completely literally was the juno beach scene is fired on for 30 seconds and it's focusing on the luftwaffe um yeah i mean it's yeah we're too you know it's too impolite i'm like even though we kicked ass multiple times these prairie farm boys and these Quebec laborers and these, you know, loggers from Northern Ontario and cattle ranchers from out West drop their lives, trained for years, went into the field under terrible conditions, stormed four to five positions on a foreign hostile coast, and then kicked the ass of the supposed elite division that also had never faced combat. How can you be elite if you've never been in the field? Thoroughly crushed them thoroughly destroyed them and somehow we're not allowed to talk about that because it's mean or german civilians got killed in the bombing campaigns allied civilians got killed too we stopped them anyway so that's a rant i probably was i wasn't planning on ranting but that's a rant so it's one day i could do something on this a video about why we do this um no and nazism is never um uh thanks laura life for coming out i appreciate it um, yeah, there's lots of people still here, so I'll keep going if you guys want. If you want me to stop, I'll stop. But if you want me to keep going, I'll keep going. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. Uh, you're right, Pat. It's, it was never a uniquely German thing. There's fascist elements everywhere. There were fascist elements in Canada during and before the war. Um, it, it's it's a thing. Um, there's fascism in the United States. There's fascism here. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. I've already done a History Rage episode, actually. I did one on Vimy Ridge. Um, yeah, that gets me angry, too. Um, I've already been there, done that. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's interesting. Um, it's not... Sorry, yeah, and then going back to... Yeah, it's never a uniquely German thing. It, it, it isn't. Someone, Some scholars have tried to claim that, and it's, it's, it's bonkers to me, because, A, that just diminishes the threat of this stuff. And then places on a, a characteristic of a group of people, so something that they supposedly have no control over. They're just going to become Nazis because of German culture from the 16th century. Like what? Like that's literally what they tried to claim. Like this has been going on for hundreds of years in a uniquely German context. And I'm just like, this is madness. That's bonkers. There's fascism in Italy. There's fascism in Spain and Portugal and North America and England and France and. Yeah, Vichy. I mean, come on. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Anyway, sorry. I saw a comment. I want to go back here. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Fred and Canuck. I appreciate that. So the best way to actually support this project um, directly is Super Chats are great through here. Becoming a YouTube channel member is great. Uh, one of the best ways, though, is through Patreon. That's linked down below. Uh, becoming a patron. Uh, you can do a couple months, one month at a time, anything. You can do as much as you're willing or able to give. Um, you can pay for a year up front uh, and then get access to everything for a year. Uh, that's the best way because I just get more of, of a, I get a bigger cut uh, from Patreon, to be honest. Um, I just get more there um, than through YouTube. Um, but anything you're willing to do, what you're comfortable with, and any way is able to support telling people about the project itself is going to be a job and a half. So any way you can share or comment on a video or comment on this when we're done or other videos I've done on Normandy would be supremely supportive and very, very helpful. Um, it's just getting word out and touching base and get all this stuff good to go. Um, it's, it's, it's a big project, so any way you can help. But Patreon is a good way to help directly um, and that way. And also, and something I didn't mention off the beginning, is through Patreon, when this gets rolling, the updates will be crazy mounts <laughs> like I've, i try to do as much as i can i know i've been a little bit behind lately just because i was working full-time on a full-time contract working full-time hours during the day and you know life happens um but yeah so i i plan on the amount of stuff and, and behind the scenes stuff too and, and extra stuff because i won't be able to fit it all it's just impossible so i'm going to do patreon only things that kind of goes against what i normally typically like to do but it'll be things that don't really fit within the series which i've done like i've done um for YouTube channel members and for patrons. I did something on, I found footage of Pele Lu. I didn't really do anything with it. I just wanted to share it because I'd never seen it in full and it's in color and it's not colorized. It was color film and it's it's brutal. It's straight up unedited. And it's, if you know anything about Pele Lu, 
I'm sure you can imagine what this footage is like. It's just, it's absolutely brutal stuff. So that allows me to do that kind of thing. And then that's kind of what you get to. You get the behind the scenes, you get the different stuff I can't do elsewhere. Um, all that good stuff. So that is a great way to support the project um, if you can, because I'm trying to set aside a pot of money, um, you know, to pay to go. And for some other stuff, I'm going to have to pay to do this. <sighs> Sorry, I just wanted to. Uh, yes, so I've already done History Rage. Yes, Mosley is a, he's a real piece of shit. Or we have, can't swear too much on YouTube, but I can say it every once in a while. He's a real piece of shit. He's awful. And people still read his stuff and like, you know, adore this guy. It's awful. Yeah. And um, Susan, I think I agree with you here is I don't know why, but Australians seem to get more attention. Again, not saying that they don't deserve attention because they do. But I see it all the time. It's even when like the Commonwealth gets mentioned. It's like, don't forget the Australians. South Africans, Canadians, and Indians, and everybody else gets left off the list. It's the New Zealanders and the Australians, because of Gallipoli, maybe? I don't know. The Brook? I have no idea. These things happen. Um, and it's, it's it's not great. It's it's not what I like. It's it, it's just I try to tell as many stories as I can. I don't do this stuff just to be Canadian only, to be Canadian only. It's just because I feel like there's a lack of this stuff. Other people are doing it, but no one's doing it this intensely or this focused. I try to do other things every once in a while, change it up and get some different insights on things and cover a wider topic. But it's mostly Canadian focus because just no one's doing it like this. People do it in snippets, but nothing major. Yeah, and that's what the problem is. Um, um, everywhere is this is on the rise. Um, it's terrible, and I don't know why we're letting this happen. Um, but yeah, oh, thank you, uh, Sean, again, for your um, support again, and your great support on being a YouTube channel member. It's amazing. Uh, it's it's uh, um, fantastic. Thank you. And again, this today's the Super Chats from today will go um, a long way, so thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to go back here. Um, Christy Pitts, right, Toronto. Sorry, I don't know what you, what you mean by here, there, Bruce. What do you mean? Please let me know what you mean. Oh, you guys are having typing troubles? Sorry about that. Yes, Fash is everywhere. Yeah, Patreon is helpful. Uh, looks like the wall is fully painted. The wall's fully painted? Oh, my wall? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I just don't have a better angle. <laughs> oh, thanks, Rob. Um, thank you uh, for all your support today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, the wall is not fully painted. I do. I need to. I need to paint that. Jeez. Uh, you're talking about the videos and stuff. No, 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 no. The videos will be uh, uh, put up here as well for YouTube channel members. I do them literally at the same time when I upload them. Like I did one today. For those of you who are patrons and, and YouTube channel members, I did um, that. Um, like the fully sounds, like, you know, when they add sounds to movies and TV shows, like I did that for the famous North Shore footage. I had one of those earlier. Uh, I had to take it away because of YouTube things, but it's back up now <laughs> and better. I think it's better because I had better sound effects because I had more money to buy something better, better software that has really cool sound effects and especially for fully sounds. It's, it's fantastic. But yes, it will be shared with both groups of people, everything I'm doing. Uh, so no, no Australian uh, ground troops. There's Australians serving in um, squadrons like RAF's. Ow, sorry, table. Ow, sorry if that was loud. Um, RAF squadrons um, uh, and some in the Navy, the Royal Navy, I believe. Um, Stephen Clark is his name. Posted on Twitter about this last night, or my last night anyway, um, about this stuff. So um, yeah, there's Australian involvement, New Zealander involvement, South African involvement. Um, even Indian, there's Indians in the uh, RAF, uh, Sri Lankan or was Ceylonese at the time um, involvement in these squadrons. So it's it's great. There's people from everywhere: Poles, Brits, or sorry, uh, Belgians, Dutch, French, uh, probably forgetting countries, Spaniards, I think. Um, people from all over the place are involved in this stuff. It's, it's crazy. Luxembourg, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, the standalone myth is stupid. 
It's never true. It was never true. One of the biggest empires by population of all time, and we're staying in this tiny little island, fought alone. Okay, sure. If you believe that, I got a bridge in Brooklyn. I'd like to sell you. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, I, I yeah. Again, I know I talk about this probably way more than I should, but it's just sometimes it's a struggle because it's just me. I'm on my own doing this. I have to do other things to pay the bills because this doesn't pay the bills on its own. So I'm now wanting to put money into this project. So I do other do other things, and it's just difficult. So it's it's a slog some days, but I'm gonna keep pushing until I can't anymore. But that's not on the foreseeable future, I don't think. Oh, no, I don't know anything about that. Sounds terrible, though, or good, for the Jewish Canadians attacking the Nazis, then I'm all in favor of that one. Um, yeah, no, um, it's a neighborhood, right? Christy Pitts, I think. I think so. I think it's still a neighborhood, isn't it? It sounds familiar. A different camera. Yeah, I'm going to change up the camera angles. <laughs> People do that. Um, um with their live streams and stuff. I can't, I just don't have the tech to do that, <laughs> but they, they, cause they got the mixing boards. I don't have a, I don't have one of those. They can change the camera one camera too, you know, be like, now I'm looking over here. Now I'm looking over here. You know, it's kind of fun. Um, they think it's good because it keeps people's attention engaged because people are moving around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Andreas. Perfect. That's a really great way to summing that up. Um, and then they just brought people blind. Oh, I'm glad that got done. Um, um, you got that finished. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Alrighty. Um, okay, so one more thing I wanted to look at. Hold on, I just got to find it because it's a bit blurry. Not the best. Um, it's one just one story from Brettville that is always, I think, so fascinating. Sorry, just give me one second here. Okay, here it is. Probably can't see very well, um, but it is what it is. I'll just read it to you. So this is part of the fighting in Brettville itself on the 9th. Uh, sorry, moved on me. Okay, so so it says at uh, 0, 3, 15 hours, an enemy armored, I think this is a, a car. It just says armored car, type of armored car. I don't know the German vehicles very well run up the main street of Brettville because they thought it would be, uh, the town was cleared and taken of Canadians. Uh, they were gone, the Canadians were gone, sorry. Uh, they go right up the main road, which is still the main road today. Um, and they stop in the middle of the street and it was knocked out by a Piat fire in front of our battalion HQ. Like it literally flies in the air and gets destroyed <laughs> like it's just they stop in the middle thinking there's nobody there and then they get piotted and flying in the air and i think the roof gets blown the hood gets blown off the car and they get killed the people in the car get killed because they stop in the middle right in the open and get blown to bits like it's 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 crazy the things that happened here and when people talk about the PI that's one of the things I first think about is this armored car stopping in the middle of Brettville while this is going on and just gets blown to pieces <laughs> apparently they're from another unit and I uh, didn't know what was going on and well they found out real fast so yeah so that's uh that's all the things i really think i wanted to share in terms of all of that fun stuff and that's directly from the war diary so and i think mark talks about the story as well yeah you're uh, quite right there um, um alex <laughs> getting pee i like just like getting pee audited oh yeah they launched this guy they blew him up real good you know as they say uh as they said on SNL, or not SNL, SCTV, how dare I? SCTV, he got blown up real good. Well, he got blown up real good. Um, yeah, so, oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, I saw, yeah, I didn't know it was baseball related, um, which is interesting. Um, I'm sure there's got to be something on, going on there. Um, whether probably bats were involved, I can imagine. Because, um, uh, you know, they make good weapons. Uh, but yeah, no, that is really, really interesting. I, I think I've heard of this now. It's ringing sort of a bell. Maybe I'm thinking of something else, um, but that's a really fascinating story. Maybe I should do some digging into that one. That would be really, really cool. 
excuse me. Um, I'm happy to take other questions. If there's other things you'd like me to talk about while you're here, please let me know. I don't have to be anywhere. Um, so if you guys have anything, anybody new, uh, anybody wants to talk about, please let me know. I'm fully open to doing so. Um, there's a few things people wanted me to talk about. I just didn't have a chance to. Uh... Yeah. Yes, I've heard about that. Yeah, I think that's it there. Sorry, I closed the window. Um, I think you're right. Hit by, hit by a German ambulance. Governor General Swicker tank got hit by a German ambulance? Huh? What does that mean? They ran into it? Like they drove into a tank? That sounds dumb. I know an ambulance ran over POWs in, in Iran. Sorry, I don't know what you mean there, Pat. <laughs> you, you've got me. You've got me confused. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or if anybody else wants anything else. We're going on two and a half hours, so thank you for those who have stuck with us and popped in and out. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, very, very glad to see um, what happened there. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. I know. I'm just sort of thinking about this riot. It's fascinating. I'm just going to go back, see if I missed anything. Yeah, I don't... An accident. Um, so they just drove straight up into a Sherman tank. I assume the Sherman won that fight. That sounds bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> You're going to have to explain that one. I know the one you're. I think I've heard this before. Maybe you told me before. I don't remember. This just sounds crazy. They might have not been. Yeah, they not been paying attention to what they were doing. What the hell else do you drive an ambulance into a damn tank? Well, I'm glad to hear that, Phil. Um, especially with a little more organization. I hope that was a little better uh, in terms of just answering questions. German one ambulance zero. <laughs> uh, it's just like bonk. Uh, Uh, well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming out, Alex. Great to have you on, on, uh, on one of these. Oh, thanks, John. I, I like doing them. I love doing them. Um, sharing knowledge and learning from you guys, like a Sherman drive or an ambulance driving into a Sherman tank. <laughs> That's just intense. Love it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's something I do enjoy doing and just hanging out with you guys and getting to talk history because I don't really have people I physically can sit around and talk history with. It's got to be done online. So it's something I do very much enjoy. Um, but uh, so, yeah. So thanks uh, for hanging out, guys. Um, sorry, I just saw a question from Andreas. No, not really. Um, there's a documentary, like a docudrama. Um, no, that was a great comment, George. Don't, ap don't ever apologize for that. That was an amazing comment. Love it. Um, uh, sorry, there was a docudrama about it. Um, I saw Alex at the uh, um, at the Laurier conference, um, um, and uh, he had a, a copy of it. Um, I've never seen it in full. I think it was on um, Amazon. It might still be on Amazon in Canada. I can't speak for other countries off the top of my head. Um, but it's kind of like a docudrama. It's not so. It's not like a full movie. But it's not you know like a full of documentary with properly sourced and everything like that. Like they recreate scenes. Yeah, not saying that's bad. Um, I'm just saying like, that's just not how I've taken it. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it, it's not quite a movie. It's not quite a documentary. So that's what they call them. Docudramas. It's kind of a term that was kind of invented. Um, but yeah. So um, yeah, great stuff. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone. Oh, thank you for becoming a uh, patron. I really, really appreciate that. Hopefully you will enjoy the, uh, uh, perks and everything that comes with it, depending on your level that you signed up with, different ones um, uh, really, really well. Um, uh, depends on what you want. Uh, and a uh, straight connection to me, which Chris knows about because he uses it all the time, when I'm happy to do it. Uh, 
Sorry, I'm just reading. Uh, yes, Norm Christie did. That's kind of what I was talking about earlier. It's just it's not that it's bad. It's just it's a bit older. So some it's relying on some older historiography. Um, you know, aka Michael Whitman. Um, so just thinking about it that um, in that sense. So it's not that it's bad. I and mean, he knows he did really really well um, with it. It's just it's a bit older and things have changed and there's no information available for some of these topics and that's what I meant. Um, yeah. So it's really really cool. Um, uh, sorry, I just saw one more. Oh, and Chris, yes, I did. I guess I didn't talk about the conference. Um, it went well. Uh, I think it went well. I had some um, interesting feedback um, about it from some individuals. Some are just, you know, not trying to do it in a mean way, but trying to get a conversation going and, you know, not taking devil's advocate position against, you know, me saying all organizations and all historians need to take on more digital elements and things like that. They're just asking, you know, thought provoking questions and those I love. I had some people kind of being like, well, isn't this kind of, um, uh, you know, isn't this kind of being, it's untested and you know, might not, you know, might be wasting money and blah, blah, blah. It might fail. And I'm like, oh, well, that's not, no one's tried. So it's, 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 it, it was, that was kind of a blowback against it. I think the rest of it was well perceived. It was about, you know, telling more stories in a more accessible way. And I think a lot of people are open to that. Uh, things like budget are always the thing that gets raised first. So my part of my presentation was talking about how to raise more money or how to use it more effectively in these formats, right? Like no museum does an AMA in Canada, right? A military history AMA or institution doesn't do an AMA like I do. Imagine if you had experts doing AMAs on specific topics from within the organization. Like that would be huge. People would love that, but it just doesn't happen. So it was things like that, and you know, trying to have more outreach and how to go about growing that outreach and in this specific kind of niche, as it said, um, all that stuff. So it's it, it was I think well received a lot. Some blowback in some weird ways, but. And it was only 20 minutes, right? You only get 20 minutes at this conference, which is, I mean, it could be good and bad if you're a first time grad student who's just starting. Um, um, sorry, I just got distraction about the witness stuff. Um, he gets enough attention. Um, yeah, so like, I mean, if you're a nervous grad student at your first conference, it's better because it's only 20 minutes. But when you've been at this for a while and you've got something you actually want to, you know, try to make an impact on a bigger area, it's kind of like, 20 minutes is all you've given me here to talk about something that could change the field. Um, so, yeah, so it's still new, right? I mean, I'm not really the only one doing this kind of thing. No one's carrying their work solely in digital spaces. Like, I think I've had one book review that's actually been published on paper. Uh, and Dave Gribbs added that Vimy book, I think, is the first time OTD has actually appeared on print somewhere. Unless someone's, like, printed it out. <laughs> I've never done it. Um, maybe now with the merch that's coming out. Also, again, that's linked down below if you want to get some cool merch related to the land mattress. Thanks again, Lorma, for that great mattress thingy. That that one's going to stay with me forever. And some stuff with the logo on it. Um, and I think Susan, who might still be watching, might not be. Uh, I've got some of that stuff. And uh, yeah, she asked. So I'd, I put that together yesterday, which was really, actually really fun to make. Um, and redoing the logo and everything. I really enjoyed that process. Um, uh, anyway, so yes, yeah, so, so I think the conference went well. Uh, it's hard to tell. I was in one of the last slot, um, um, last slot on the last panel, and then Terry Cop was up next. So people's attention obviously go to Terry, and rightfully so. He's talking about the Italian campaign and, and and remembering it and how we go about that. And it was a fascinating talk for any of those who saw it and who were there. It it was great. Uh, yeah, so I think it went well, um, and hopefully I can maybe morph that into a video and. And maybe I use that as a way to outreach the channel a little bit, is giving some of my insights to institutions and how they can kind of grow here on YouTube or digitally speaking to reach different people. Uh, yeah, but yes, uh, Phil, you are right. Uh, Norm Christie brought the Canadian perspective earlier than most and in a more accessible way. Completely agree. Yep, and forever um, grateful for that. I... Gained over who? Oh, your buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome. If you want more, I can help you. If you want to win a history fight. <laughs> history knowledge fight. Yeah, uh, those Whitman grave pictures make me want to puke. I went there because I went there to go to the cemetery. You saw his grave because, of course, it was covered in flowers and crosses and all this shit. 
and I had to leave the cemetery before I yelled out something inappropriate. And I left. I, I never went back in. I, I left the cemetery and waited outside for everybody else to finish. Oh, well, thank you, Pete. I appreciate it. I appreciate your support at the conference. Um, really, really great. Um, Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Um, well, I need the support. Like I said, again, it's not in a pity way. And uh, if, if you guys like what I'm doing, I just I need help to get it to that point because my the view numbers aren't enough to live off, you know, ad stuff. Right. It's just it's not enough in the way that YouTube works nowadays, maybe back 10 years ago, but not anymore. Um, they changed it and it really had an impact on how much people could make. The numbers went way down. Yeah, the stuff is, the Whitman stuff is disgusting. Yes, the caribou. People, what, I've heard it called an ook, uh, a nuke. <laughs> I just combined moose and elk together. A mook. Uh, elk, yeah, called, somebody called it, an, uh, people call it an elk, a uh, moose, a <laughs> deer. <laughs> it's, it's the Newfoundland caribou. Uh, it's, tec it's technically the one at Beaumont and Mel. Um, and I use that for a particular reason because it, it's another thing, like I, you guys know, things stick with me. And I discussed those things, and that's one of them, and that's why I use it as the logo, because that ground at Beaumont and Mel. Again, we're going off topic here, but um, it's uh, um, it was just it stuck with me and the ground and everything that went on there, because it wasn't just the 1916 fighting that took literally place at that patch of ground that was first owned by the, the government of Newfoundland and then now by government of Canada. Um, there was fighting there in 1918 as well. Um, that's why there's a Highlander memorial there. Um, no, it's not a moose. It's a caribou. It's not a moose. The antlers are thinner. That's all you'd tell. The body's different. Moose are freaking huge. Caribou are reindeer. Moose are freaking gigantic. <laughs> like, there's videos of moose. Don't go near a moose. If you ever see a moose, don't go near it. It's a smaller one, especially don't go near it because it's probably a baby and the mother's nearby and will end your life and generations of, of the rest of you. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> don't go near them. I wouldn't go near caribou, caribou either, but it's no, it's 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 the caribou. It's a trail of the caribou. They're all over Western Europe. There's now one in Gallipoli. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, don't go near them. They are terrifying. They hit a car and the car comes off or... Um, you can't go off topic to do it. I go off topic all the time. It happens. <laughs> At least it's me. I don't have to keep somebody else on uh, um, on track. You you guys shouldn't go to Beaumont and Mel. It's on the Psalm. I assume you're doing the Psalm. I assume you're doing Fipal. It's not that far from there. Everyone should go. Well, there's preserved trenches, so I don't. There's preserved trenches there in Vimy Ridge. It's the one place. Is it, there's other places like Hill 62 has them, or 60 Hill 60 Hill 60. Um, um, it's uh, it's got preserved trenches. Like they didn't touch them. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Caribou, yeah, cars fight, then they get destroyed, and the moose just goes, "What was that?" and walks back off into the forest. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's moose are insane. It's crazy. But yes, caribou is good. I have had it and I like it. it. Tastes like beef, just lean beef. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about this really quick. So Phil, yeah. So thanks for, cause what he told me this himself. Um, sorry. I might, hopefully I don't get emotional cause you know, sometimes I, as I do, I almost gave up, uh, two months ago. I was ready to stop everything. Uh, everything. All of it. Uh, Twitter, social media, this. I wasn't going to delete anything. I was going to just stop contributing. It was too much. Uh, too much for nothing. I was taking lots of abuse, uh, lots of neo-Nazi abuse. Now I just kind of let it roll off my shoulder. I've dealt with it better now. Uh, it just wasn't, the channel wasn't doing well. Um, that numbers had dropped to the worst they'd ever been. Uh, even when I, they were one of my numbers like when I started. So they were really, really, really bad. I was just going to give up and figure out something else. I don't know what, but something else. So hopefully I never get to that point again. But I was very close to just packing it in. I was doing too much other stuff. I couldn't keep up this, and it wasn't going well, and a lot of negativity coming my way. Not from anybody here, by any means. Definitely not, because you guys are awesome. Uh, just other people, and people have been... Certain people have belittled my work in the past and said it's pointless and it's not going to be successful in the way you want it to be and uh, and that kind of stuff. So that was really weighing on me uh, and really doing a number on me. So I was very close to just throwing in the towel. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, it's uh, I get it. I definitely get it. What he's told me about this himself, um, how he almost gave up, and my numbers are lower than it is by a lot. So and, and he's done a ton of work, and so have I. And I've been doing other things, obviously, but. Um, so yeah, so that's why I like doing things like this because it helps. Uh, and again, you guys have been helping with YouTube channel memberships and being patrons and super chats and uh, yeah, it's um, um, it's uh, it's not easy some days. I'm not gonna lie, and I was at the worst point I was with just giving up. I was just gonna announce I'm done. Uh, maybe in the future I'll come back, but no, I'm saying I'm done. Uh, but I didn't. I'm glad I didn't because I don't know what else I would do. This is what I want to do. So uh, everyone's help is, is fantastic. So thank you. Yeah. So you're doing this on, I mean, I mean, it's pretty unavoidable. Um, yeah. Well, I've never been to those ones. Um, makes sense. The ones at Vimy are pretty cool because they were bored waiting for the construction to get going with the, uh, the actual monument itself. So they just started to preserve the trenches because they weren't doing anything else. Oh, well, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, it's really, really interesting um, that it's helping you. That's the idea, right? It's helping people who might not know this stuff or may have heard these stories and want to get it more in depth or learn how I go about doing what I do, right? Because my stuff is academically based. So I'm, I'm glad it's helping you and doing what you're doing, which and you're doing great stuff as well, helping bring this story generally out, which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, um, so I don't know what NN means, but um, nosy something, <laughs> probably. Uh, but yeah, some people have just bring negativity and try to encourage the, the quitting, which is not helpful. So yeah, James Noonan on J Juno Beach. James Noonan, formerly known as Scotty from the original Star Trek. Uh, Mark Miller talks about it again in Stop the Panthers uh, and how that whole thing goes because he's an artillery He's a foo, so a forward observation officer. That's what he's trained to do. He goes in very early on Juno Beach, um, leads people in, uh, leads some infantry in. He's not in the infantry. That's it's erroneously claimed. Um, so he gets goes in, leads an attack in, and joins it, or leads it, or joins it. It's unclear. Um, so they do that. Um, and then he comes back to the OP on the beach and gets fired upon by a sentry, uh, by a Canadian who lights him up really, really badly. He loses a finger. Uh, sometimes you can see it in the show. Um, he did a pretty good job of trying to hide it because he wanted to. And I mean, in interviews and stuff, he didn't care. He talked about it all the time. Um, but just in the show, he tried to hide it. Uh, just, I guess, for character reasons or continuity reasons or whatever. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he took a serious wound. He lost a finger. Comes back into service as a pilot. He learns to fly a plane doesn't join the RCAF. He stays in the Canadian Army. Well, they have a program is where they train foos to spot rounds, the fall of rounds, while flying in these tiny little Oster planes, which are tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny. And they are the ones who spot the rounds. And they have to do this upside down, which is insane. <laughs> And apparently Duna never did combat runs. He, he just ran out of, um, the time the war ran out. Um, he did all kinds of, yeah, Piper Cub, yeah. The same idea. Um, very tiny little thing. And to spot the fall of these rounds. Uh, and it's it's nuts. He never did it in combat, and he was apparently one of the best pilots, but he also did it in a ton of stuff, dumb stuff. So I think that's one of the reasons why they kept him out of the field, because he could have gone. He was trained enough time. To serve when the war was getting later uh, but he uh um yeah the the commonwealth used osters but they might have used cubs as well i don't remember um i did some digging on this when i did something on doing a while back um because i did one uh, a little short about celebrities you know who had served in the war did um james dunan um uh, uh eddie bauer and uh not Eddie Bauer. Johnny Bauer. Jesus. That stupid story always gets stuck in my head. Um, somebody else. I forget. Uh, anyway, so I was just doing some digging into that. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, 
Anyway, yeah, so his crazy story, he was doing kind of crazy flights and things, and he got in trouble. And they were going to take his license away <laughs> not let him do it. But then the war ended, and it didn't really matter. Uh, but, yeah, so he, he uh, um, the, uh, and then he goes on to do an acting career afterwards. Uh, he says because he was just really good at accents, so he decided to try acting. It's, it's crazy how the world works eh? and how people leave their um, um imprint on these things it's 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 crazy yeah arrow pips i know right like it's crazy <laughs> it's nuts and uh well there is a i did a short of a a cameraman who was killed when the when the spotter plane gets hit um, over the rhine and he dies um it's and he films it he doesn't film himself he's filming the rhine and you can see when he gets hit because the camera goes straight up it's awful Yes, Pete, thank you again. <laughs> Another cash envelope. Yeah, that doesn't sound sketchy at all, like in some back alley somewhere in Oshawa. Uh, no, I'm not going to Aquino Day. I, I couldn't make it work. It's too far, and I was just down there. And I have to go back down again in another fairly soon, so I just couldn't get away. Those train prices are ridiculously expensive, and we've got the one car we needed up here at the time. So it's just it's not going to work this time, unfortunately. I would have liked to, but I just don't think it's going to work. But I'm hoping to come down again later in the summer. Um, trying to do a thing of getting people to come together to go to the um, uh, Heritage, Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton. But uh, stay tuned for information on that shortly. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you on this one. Um, I mean, they have the cubes, right, as they're called. I, the book. I just found it again after I cleaned up. I put it somewhere. Um, anyway, the, the cubes, they mark their granite blocks that mark the battlefields, um, right, because you have the competition. That led to the Bimbi Memorial, and then you had the one at Second Eep at uh, Vancouver Corner, the Brooding Soldier. So the idea was that the Brooding Soldier was going to be marking all the other battlefields. Um, it was too expensive, so they just went, they moved to a granite block. It just happens they put the first one up at Second Eep, which is the first major battle anyway. Uh, so it's, that's what stuck. Um, the rest are just cubes marking the positions. They're kind of out of the way, some are next to cemeteries, that kind of thing. Some are in more prominent locations. Um, so they have them. It's just marking the actual spots, the private property. Some of them, it's hard to mark them. It's hard to do that. So I think it's just bringing more attention to them is a good thing. But I don't seem to think we're going to see that with other First World War battlefields moving forward. Not that the centenary is over. I don't think we'll see that ever, to be honest with you. Yeah, all the plans are basically the same. Yes, and, and Woody did a great show on that. With I forget the name of the guest. That's going to bug me. Um, but yeah, it was a great show. The stuff that the author did on... Uh, uh, Josephine Baker, great story. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Pat. It has nothing to do with political affiliation. It has nothing to do with timing. This has been going on forever. Um, liberals done it. The conservatives have done it. They all do it, and it's it's awful. And they only do it for political points and votes, and they all do it, and it's awful. <laughs> well, back alleys are more fun. Uh, yes, that is that is him, Bill. Same guy. Yes, I, I did know about that. Damien Lewis, that's his name. The author. Great stuff. That was a great show. Um, yeah, so yes, well, he was the drummer of Def Leppard first and then lost the arm in a car accident and then learned to drum with one arm, which is just, that's insane. And I don't know why I remember that, but uh, I do. <laughs> Things that we remember, right? It's crazy. Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's good. There really hasn't been many more questions. Unless, again, if somebody wants to, go ahead. I still got lots of time, so you don't have to stick around if you don't want to. Sorry, I just get dehydrated. But yes, I appreciate all the support from those watching. So if anyone has any kind of questions they want to answer now, or like D-Day, Normandy, whatever, uh, by all means, maybe I'll do one again kind of at the end. Um um like towards the, the anniversary of the end of the campaign right with like uh, curry and the closing of the gap i could do that again we could do like a normandy ama uh, but if anyone wants to now um, yeah oh that's yes yeah he was yeah which is really cool that's amazing wow, that's a cool connection to have that's fantastic very very cool No, uh, no, uh, I haven't. I've only heard about the project that's being done there, the, the Puto one. 
uh, with the, the little black devils. Um, nothing else. Um, I, I wouldn't. I would be very surprised if there was. I don't know who would make it, um, and what money they're using. Um, because as a lot of you know, the Canadian war movies out there are terrible. Um, are just straight up awful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. No, uh, if you have, please tell me. But uh, no. Uh, yeah, so I've already reached the monetization goals. I'm good to go. They, they, I don't have to worry about that. So I was talking about for World War One TV, for, for, for Lucy and Woody, um, helping them by watching i don't i want you to watch um of course and i want to hang out with you guys but i'm not worried about those numbers anymore i mean the more you watch of a video like say i do a five minute video and you only watch one minute like that hurts my numbers because it's called retention um you know that's what's important for getting the video to be watched by more people so like if it's a five minute video please watch the whole video like not necessarily for a live stream because i'm not really intending these to be watched much more after this um um, you know, um, sorry, I'm just getting some of the questions. <laughs> I got another question on the sidebar, and it's really interesting. I'm, my head's getting distracted. Um, yeah, so so not for me personally, but I would like you to watch. But uh, um, it's not uh, something I'm after anymore. I don't have any milestones to reach. The only thing, like, I think I'm getting stopped from doing. I don't think I think they really they've released everything now with my level because I'm over five thousand subscribers. Like the last, the next threshold used to be ten thousand. I mean, I still want to hit that number because just better, num bigger numbers impress more people. Um, um, yeah. Um, so no, but it helped them. They definitely need it. Not me. Yes, the Passion Dome movie was uh, awful. Yes, th that's another reason why I want to go is to capture this. These it's the vista. It's a vista. If you've been there, like it's it's hard to describe. And you know, there's that talking about this position. And how brutal the fighting was, if you know, at the Gap and 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 Chambois and all of that stuff, it, and that quote I've read of where these guys were coming in afterwards after the you know the Gap had been sealed to help you know get everything moving again, and there were so many flies in the air they thought it was fog and clouds. It was flies from the debt, and it's just like I, as soon as I stood at that museum, I'm like I can picture this, and the smell and ugh um it's just yeah like it's, it's hard to capture these things and talk about them like i can show you if i can get there i mean it's stuck in my head it's stuck in there and that's why i want to share it so this is a really interesting question yeah because somebody asked what do you about this in one of the uh, amas he was doing um, okay if you were in the right age during world war ii same country where do you think you would have ended up I, I probably medically unfit um probably um, if we're going to do the same progression of my life as it was at 18, 19, uh, at the time, I was probably medically unfit. Um, I have a condition, a very, very unknown condition. Most people never even heard of it. Um, that doesn't affect me anymore, which is crazy. Um, is I had a condition when I was much younger, an infant. Um, where the brain fluid didn't drain out of my head properly. So this, because, you know, infants, uh, skulls aren't formed, right? So the, the, they, for reasons, so the brain can grow. And for childbirth, um, it didn't. So the bones were moving improperly because the fluid wasn't draining out. So they had to put in a, a, a drainage. And at the time, in the 40s, that this drainage had not been invented. So I probably would have died as an infant. And not a sob story, it's just the truth. <laughs> but if, if say, this had it and existed, that probably would have made me uh, medically unfit. Uh, and plus I messed up my knees playing football. So those would also probably put me on the unfit list because they were, they're, they're really bad. Like I can't really lift very heavy things very far, maybe in the air force, <laughs> but I think I would probably be medically unfit. So war work, my grandfather worked in a mosquito factory, made mosquitoes. So probably something like that. The London area where I grew up, I guess, if we're going to do that, I, I, I don't, I don't think I would be medically fit for military service um, for those reasons. Um, so yeah, probably a war worker, farmer maybe, as ancestors, recent ancestors who were farmers. Um, but they weren't farming by that point because of the Depression. They gave up the farm because they couldn't afford it anymore. So war worker, I guess, working in a factory. Sounds terrible. <laughs> Important, but terrible. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, I mean, up the hill. It's insane. Uh, the Passion Dill love story is completely made up. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's all fictional characters. So, and yes, it's Shun Norton, and none of it makes any damn sense. That's terrible. Ah, uh, what is you? Ah, uh, yes. Stupendous. Football or soccer? Uh, American, uh, as we call it, football. So helmets and pads and beating the shit out of each other type of sport. Football, American, American football. Not sorry. I did play soccer too, but my knees were already messed up before playing soccer. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's about how many people watch it. So it's not necessarily about the reflection of the length. But yeah, so like it needs to be. So say if it was one video that was an hour, you needed to watch 4,000 times in full to get them that 4,000 hours. It's not easy. It took me forever to get there. I'm not going to lie. Um, took forever um, for me to get there. So they need help. So that's why I'm trying to mention it for them. Yeah, mine were all football. <laughs> Too short for me to get at my knees. I was 6'3 playing running back. I think that explains why my knees are messed up. Yeah, yeah, it's four thousand hours of, uh, of of full out watch time. So like you guys have been sitting here for three. So if you watch this whole thing, I'd get the three hours. I mean, it doesn't matter anymore. But no one should have gone to watch that movie anyway. It's a terrible movie. Uh, yeah, sorry, Alex. Sorry to burst your bubble there, bud. But uh, it's not good. It's so hard. It took me a year and a half. Yeah, a year and a half. Um, yeah, it took forever. Um, yeah, sort of burst your bubble, but it's not easy unless you have something that goes viral and is in a decent length. Uh, but shorts also don't count. So if you're trying to do shorts, it doesn't matter. It won't help you. It might get, it'll get you subscribers, but it won't get you uh, watch hour. Sorry, we're going YouTube nerdy here. Yeah, and I played linebacker too. So I was literally in the middle. Um, yeah, I was literally in the middle of it all the whole time. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, I think it's even two. Well, I think the average NFL career is two. But yeah, like star running backs play like eight years. Yeah. Oh, thank you, George. Well, I'm sure they appreciate that. But yeah, that's what I mean, you know. Um, 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 so yeah, it's like telling other people, right? Um, okay, see you, Chris. Thank you. Um a few kittens from Canada. My dad's what my dad said. Try to do uh, um, um, find people like falling down or something funny because <laughs> he was watching. It was just on YouTube and he saw this video of you know, people being like doing stupid things, you know, and he's like uh, um, all that other things, right? So it's, it's just hilarious. Um, he's like, do that. I'm like, I got to search for that. It doesn't just show up. America's funniest war films or something, you know, I just thought it'd be funny. But uh, people do love, do love cats and dogs. So that is one way to do it. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I just want to finish up again by saying the Normandy Project, the OTD Normandy Project is going to be uh, a big one if I can get it to where I want it to be. Uh, and again, I know a lot of you who are already here at the beginning are, are oh, I'm having, am I still here? Um, um, I think I'm still good. Yes, still here. Um, so I'm going to need help with that. So I, the way I envision it, it's going to need a trip to Normandy um, to do it properly. So any support you can give that can help the channel generate some income will be fantastic. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. I think my mom was talking about that same one, this bear camera. <laughs> she was showing me the old ones. You need. I do want a pet caribou. I don't think my wife would like that very much, seeing we live in a condo. <laughs> no pet <laughs> uh, anyway, yes. So if you aren't already a, a Patreon, um, oh yeah. Sorry, I keep getting you guys are good, keep having so many good comments. Um, yeah, uh, Westerbork is a really interesting story, uh, sad one. Um, uh, yeah, um, I agree. I completely agree with you. I mean, the Dutch have done a fantastic job with their museum system and working together and outreach. So I can't, I, can't, I have no power to do anything about this, but I completely agree. 
Uh, anyway, so yes, I'm going to start my spiel and then we'll uh, sign off. But yes, going to Normandy next year is is for me as well on the list. Obviously, what caribou puppet could work? I could get a little like a like a little plush caribou or something and yeah, put him in the background, maybe. Um, anyway, I am so distracted. Uh, anyway, so yes, the Normandy project is probably the biggest project I have ever envisioned and actually started moving. Um, because the beaver's overdone. Beavers, are, everyone's a beaver. And I want something different. I like to be different, as you guys probably know. Uh, anyway, i got to focus. <laughs> thank you again. If you're already a patron, YouTube channel member, have given a super chat, all of that stuff, thank you so much. It uh, means the world. It's very helpful. And all of that's going to go into um, the pot, so to speak. Um, so I'm going to do um, probably more of these to try and generate some more interest focus on, you know, Normandy stuff, get some other stuff together to kind of show what I can put together. I'm going to release that trailer that I showed at the beginning as a separate video right now. Uh, See so how that other video I did, I put up earlier today. Watch that. If you haven't, the D-Day, it's called D-Day Sounds or the Sounds of D-Day. Check that out uh, and let the ads play. That's another way you can help. So if you can become a patron for, I think there's literally an option for one Canadian dollar a month. I think that is literally an option. One dollar a month. Um, and directly charged and easy. You could pay the $11 it would be to pay for upfront for a year right now through Patreon. And I get a good chunk of that money. So um, that's helpful. Uh, and YouTube as well. So if you can, please do. Those who already have, thank you. Uh, and stay tuned. Uh, I give my updates first as those of you who know our YouTube channel members, patrons, I do the updates there first. They get information way in advance uh, about what's going on or what I'm planning that's where the news is announced for sometimes a month in advance more uh, and there'll be more stuff behind the scenes and as uh, well chris just left but uh, you get research help too if you're one of the higher tiers i will help you if you have some research you want to do i will help you um, there's information uh on patreon about that um but uh, on youtube uh, as a youtube channel member just contact me there's thunder outside sorry it just scared me um contact me directly and we can set something up uh, if you're in the higher tier on youtube uh, so with that said, thank you. And if anyone's new, please do subscribe, like the videos, and leave a comment down below after well as well. Helps uh, the channel, generally speaking. Uh, and any video, if you can leave a comment, it's very helpful. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. Thank you for listening and talking about the stories I wanted to share about uh, Normandy, D-Day, Canada's involvement, uh, the story from uh, Stanley Bach, and all the other stuff. Um, so thanks again and, uh, have a good rest of your day. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week and, uh, stay tuned for details about what I'll be working on next with the channel. Other than that, I will see everyone next time and have a good one.